I'm going to talk about insomnia and I'm hoping that all of you guys got probably good night's sleep except for the speakers who are busy preparing the slides so the half of the night is gone for that. Um, why should we know about insomnia? That is the first question. So the sleep loss, whether it is due to insomnia or whether it is due to the behaviorally induced sleep restriction which I think all of us are aware of it is very important. It does cause a lot of cardiovascular problem, MI, heart attack, heart failure. Even the recent studies have shown a quite bit association of sleep deprivation and cancer. You know, people always say, I don't smoke, I don't drink. Why do I get cancer? Yes, there is a genetic variation, but we never estimate the value of a sleep. So a lot of medical problems are happening, but if I show you the economical impact created by the sleep and the sleep restriction, you will be surprised to see these numbers. United States is losing almost $411 billion per year, which is 2.2% of the country's GDP. And these numbers are from 2010, 2011. So probably the current numbers are more than double of this value. And I don't have a numbers for the India. But I'm pretty sure that the, we are also losing a lot of values just because of the sleep restriction and sleep disorders. So all of us, not only for your patients, whatever I'm going to talk in the next 10 minutes or so, will be very helpful for you all guys. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the pathophysiology of the sleep or the insomnia. Uh, just going straight away to the four important pillars of the treatment of insomnia. And three of them are actually non-pharmacological, we'll talk in more detail. The diet, exercise and alcohol avoidance, good sleep hygiene, cognitive behavioral therapy and pharmacotherapy. So I have a question for all of you guys. I think you guys are all that uh, voting pad. Mrs. X, she's a 60 year old female, not able to sleep for the last 10 years. This is a complaint as a primary care doctor. I think you heard almost on a daily basis. Which one of the following diets increases the incident and prevalence of insomnia? A. Fruits, B. Vegetables, C. Whole grains and D. Starch. Excellent. Wow, I don't need to teach you guys anything actually. Uh, this came from one of the studies known as a Women's Health Initiative study recently published in 2020. They have studied more than 50,000 women of the age 50 to 80 years. They were given the questionnaire for the food and the questionnaire for the sleep, including the insomnia rating scale. And they followed them for a three years. So I think pretty reasonably good conducted study. And what they found that the added sugars, starch and the refined grains does increase or do increase the incidence of the insomnia. I think the sugar all of us are familiar with. You know, the young kid, the Pancharasan Chokra, cookie na apta hai, biscuit na apta, otherwise he won't be able to sleep and create a havoc at night. But other things like including the, the refined grains also increase the insomnia. On the other side, the fruits, not the fruit juice, the vegetables, fiber, and the whole grain do improve the insomnia. So I think you guys can give this kind of advice to your patients. The second case I have is a Mr. Maximus who is a 55 year old office worker working from 8 to 4 p.m. Drinks two glasses of the wine. I think in the least in United States there is a belief uh, that the wine improves everything uh, and uh, smokes a pack of a cigarette. Runs on the treadmill around 9 p.m. Trying to sleep around 10, 30 to 11 p.m. On the phone for 45 to 60 minutes. Sounds familiar guys? Right? I think all of us are now phone or dicting. Um, actual sleep time is around 12 midnight and sleep latency is 30 to 60 minutes. Four out of the seven nights the guy wakes up around 4, 4.30 a.m. and then cannot go back to sleep. Final wake up time is at 6 a.m. so he will toss and turn in the bed till that time and he feels exhausted during the day. So what might be the next best intervention for this person to prevent midnight awakenings? Change the sleeping time stop smoking, stop drinking, or stop exercise. Wow, so this one definitely needs some intervention, looks like. Uh, I think the correct answer for a midnight awakenings are stop drinking alcohol. It's so ironic that I have to talk about the alcohol in a state of a Gujarat where alcohol is actually bad. The reason I brought this particular concept because a lot of my friends, the family members or the you know extended the people I know 
have a permit to drink alcohol, legal permit to drink alcohol in Gujarat and the indication is insomnia. And I was wondering like how come the insomnia is being treated by the alcohol and how the government has given this permission because alcohol absolutely creates other way around problem. Alcohol does increase, uh, I mean it's a worse quality of sleep. It does increase those midnight awakenings and it is proportionate to the amount of alcohol drink. You know like 10% if you have a low alcohol drinker, 20% if it's a moderate and 40% if it is a heavy alcohol drinker at night. Not only that, it does reduce the REM sleep, especially in the first and second cycles. That's why people do get awake. I think a lot of you guys might have experienced this one. But you may not have realized that this is the impact of alcohol. Even myself, I have realized this one. Uh, middle of night, 4 o'clock, you are awake and then you can't go back to sleep. And finally, increases the incidence of sleep apnea. So I think alcohol is a worst situation for the insomnia. I'm not going to tell Mr. Modi or the Patel to change the constitution of the Gujarat. But the alcohol should not be a remedy for the insomnia. So what uh, will be the next step we said and why the other answers are wrong. Uh, so of course the changing the time is not feasible if he is going to wake up at 4 a.m. What is going to do till the 8 a.m. before his work time. Stop smoking. 101 percent is going to improve the sleep onset insomnia. This guy had a middle of night awakening problem and that was a question. Nicotine is a very stimulant substance and significantly underestimated to cause insomnia. It may improve the sleep maintenance insomnia, but if stopping smoking definitely will improve the sleep onset insomnia. Stop drinking alcohol was a correct answer. Now stop treadmill or exercise during the night or the evening hours. I am not saying people should not exercise. Don't take a wrong message. Not before the bedtime or not during the evening hours because that does release the cortisol and adrenaline and that does keep the people away. So our patient is so good, you know, the why not, uh, things happen in movies, so things happen in conference also. He stopped drinking, just by my advice, awesome. Stop smoking after the, the evening time and change the time of exercise to 5 p.m. Now the same patient, what can you do to improve his sleep onset insomnia? Should you consider trazodone? Should you consider melatonin? Should you consider steep stimulus therapy? Or consider app-based noise therapy? You guys have a lot of apps on iPhone and Android. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> so melatonin is not the correct answer. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine actually has not recommended melatonin ever for a garden variety insomnia and same thing for a trazodone. That is so common practice not only here everywhere in the whole world but that is actually not an approved medication. The treatment here is a stimulus control therapy uh, and app based therapy has absolutely no data. So no melatonin or no uh, trazodone. What is sleep stimulus control therapy or stimulus control therapy? The don't check a time in the bed. When you are in a bed approximately within next 15 to 20 minutes which is a normal latency. If you are not able to sleep, when the lights are out, lights room is dark and cold. People should go out of a bedroom. People should go to the living room, kitchen, do something they do not like. For example, if you don't like a history book, read the history book, you automatically fall. I mean, as soon as your eyes are sleeping, go back to bed and then try to sleep. Don't just lie down in the bed. I have so many Indian patients. That is actually a wrong thing to do. That will increase the insomnia. So do not do that. Other part is a good sleep hygiene. We have a textbook statement that says that the bed and the bedroom is reserved for the sleep and sex. Nothing else. So what do we do in the bedroom? You guys are all familiar uh, with all these things. People do watch TV. People read books. People do uh, play the video games and all these things are significantly problematic and people should not do anything. Remember the bed and bedroom is only for the sleep and sex. Nothing yet should intervene. Otherwise the insomnia is going to be increased. Don't drink coffee, tea, soda uh, at least 3-4 hours, 5 hours before the bedtime. Again, for us that's a common belief. You know, class Yeah, when you are 20 years old, of course that is possible. But when you are 70 years old or 60 years old, even a glass of a tea or a coffee is going to keep you awake because the caffeine half-life goes down when we get older and older. So you can see that if you drink coffee at 12 noon, the effect remains to some extent even till the next morning, 6 a.m. So it's amazingly profound problematic situation increases the uh, increase the insomnia 
So I created a little this uh, cartoon diagram to give you the combined or composite message what people should do. If I zoom in, this is what will happen that the, you have to have a scheduled bedtime and wake up time. Don't uh, do the caffeine or the tea or the alcohol or sugar, significant sugar six hours before. Don't exercise three hours before. Don't uh, drink, uh, I mean, the heavy, avoid heavy meals two hours before. And this is a class one recommendation from American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which none of us are probably following. Prevent the screen time, uh, any type of a screen, the cell phone, the iPad, the TV, at least an hour prior to the designated bedtime. Reserve the room or the bedroom for the sleep only. And if you are having a significant insomnia, prevent napping. That's a very important part. People who do not have a problem with insomnia, napping may improve the sleep and the efficiency. People do have a problem with sleep apnea, they should not nap. Pharmacological treatment is very difficult, but I just want to give a one last message here that the, this is the last question. 75 year old person has a mild depression, has a sleep onset insomnia. Which of the following sleeping pill is safe? None of them. None of the uh, none of the sleep medications are sleep for the older patients. And we, I can tell you, for a whole hour, we have so much literature just for an entire hour that the, all sleeping pills are significantly problematic. For example, all the Z drugs, including benzodiazepines and the solpidem, for example, they do create abuse and dependence. Uh, around thirty thousand people were studied, and there is a potential to misuse, abuse, dependence, and withdrawal-related side effects. The people have a significant amount of traumatic brain injury and hip fractures. People have a significant risk of the dementia, which people don't even understand that the, why the benzodiazepines and zolpidem should cause dementia, but there is a part of it significant association. So all of those medications are significantly harmful and that's why American Academy of Sleep Medicine has mentioned that we do not want to give a sleeping pill for a longer time. That longer time is kind of abused by both the patients and the physicians. With that, I will say sleep well and keep your health. Thank you so much. I have nothing to disclose. No support from any pharma industry. No money, no conference, nothing. Obesity is a combination of all this chronic disease, uh, obesity and appetite misregulation and their complications. So I'll go very smoothly, very shortly into directly what is obesity. In Asian population, BMI more than 23 to 25 range is pre-obesity and more than 25 is obesity. So what is BMI? BMI is weight divided by height square. So if example we have 5 feet, 5 foot 7 inch, weight is about 75 kilogram which is our average, we are already obese. So it's very easy to calculate BMI. And every study has shown that life expectancy decreases as BMI increases. Simple. So obesity is a very morbid disease and it's complex. Obesity is energy intake, energy expenditure. Very simple again we have known over the years. And it's a combination of lot of factors. But two factors are very important. One is, is increased palatability if you see there, and then environment is inactive, lifestyle, smoking, cessation, psychological factors. Multiple complications in obesity, multiple. And uh, people have counted up to 220, 30 complications across entire organ system. So I'll directly come to the management of people with overweight or obesity. Surgery used to be there and behavioral was there. I am of the belief behavioral modification does not work. People write, there are all this, it's all garbage. Truly, it's a very radical statement. We can't change behavioral modification after 40 years of life, 50. It all comes down to how many of you have their LDL less than 70 from change in diet, not a single person. 70 is the new LDL mantra. It's all going to be pharmacotherapy. So first, let's talk about bariatric surgery, and I won't go in detail. There's lab band, gastric sleeve, gastric bypass, all that, but there's a lot of complication in bariatric surgery. 
long term complications are already there. I have lost two patients in bariatric surgery. I have three patients who are miserable. So against five happy patients, there are five very unhappy patients. How did peptic ulcer management change? I'll tell you, in 1981, I did my final MBBS, in 80 actually. Bilroth 1 was my major viva. Any of you remember Bilroth 1? Raise your hands. Bilroth 1. I see a lot of people not raising the young, black haired ladies and gentlemen who are not raising. Bilroth 1 was a major surgical viva question. Bilroth 1, Bilroth 2. And we used to go kafai from Love and Bailey. You remember Love and Bailey, textbook of surgery. What happened in the 80s? Renitidine came, H2 receptor, proton, it's gone. People don't even know. I talked to my children who are doctors. They said, what are you talking about? I can predict the future of bariatric surgery and I'm so happy there's no bariatric surgeon here. So pharmacotherapy for obesity management should start even at borderline plus obesity. So we'll come to the point. GLP-1 receptor agonist. What are those drugs? These are drugs which do triple things. They increase in creatine hormones which help in increasing insulin. They inhibit glucagon secretion and they slow gastric emptying. It's a combination. <laughs> Multiple drugs have come of which some are available. Dulaglutide, semaglutide, approved in India but not available. Ozempic, Ozempic is back ordered, back available in America also by few months. Liraglutide and Tirzepatide, in which we participated in the trial a few months ago, is now approved. All for diabetes and all for weight loss. So what are the pharmacologic options? Of all the options, if you see, the best is Semaglutide so far and Terpetazide. And it works in a number of ways. It works through decreasing hunger, increasing satiety, satiety is paid bhareja eulage. So the obesity management of future is going to be drugs, drugs, drugs and drugs. Kegrisema is a new combination which will be available in a year or two. It's a combination of semaglutide and kegrilinitide where the weight loss efficacy is phenomenal. It's a once a week combination. So to conclude in last few slides, role of anti-obesity medicine summary. It's a very promising 16 to 20 percent weight loss. Even people who need bariatric surgery should go on drugs for a few months. And people who cannot maintain weight loss and gain their weight again, very common, can benefit from maintenance dose. Couple of cases. This is a case, this is a real case. 55 year old female, diabetes since three years, obesity, knee joint pain, weight 100 kilogram, HB1C is high. GFR is slightly reduced on multiple medications. Diagnosed three years back with diabetes. We put her on semaglutide. It's available in India as ribelsus. This is an off-label use. What this means is it's not approved for weight loss. It's approved for diabetes. That is what we started her on. But look at the weight reduction she had. And eventually her HB1C became normal because Beside diabetes, the weight loss continued. And after the treatment, significant weight loss, significant HB1AC reduction. And eventually antihypertensive drugs were stopped, thyroxine was stopped, and anti-diabetic drugs were reduced to nil. Summary, it was a great drug for this patient. Second case, a patient, 72-year-old patient, my patient, long-standing diabetes, multiple morbidity, HB1C high, ejection fraction low, borderline weight, but BMI was high and sugar was high. I started oral semaglutide few months ago after the treatment. If you see the weight came down only by 3 kilograms, 7 pounds, but the random sugar started improving, HB1C started improving, ejection fraction improved. Again summary. In borderline high BMI also, these drugs, especially in diabetics, are useful class of drugs. So what are the treatment options now? Again, lifestyle modification. They listen to you. How many times they change their lifestyle? Nobody changes lifestyle. Do I change my lifestyle? 
to some degree yes but i still enjoy eating great food you will see all this calorigenic obesity food today in the conference tomorrow in the conference we tried in one year box lunches kone khadela mara box lunches everybody complained believe me even the gujarat medical association credit monitor ja gaya tha ne me to motta moti complaint kare pushkar bate ke sahab aao kya khamlao chho na ke kaan pakdo chho ne khamlao so you see lifestyle modification all that you believe you you may be right but doesn't work so eventually is pharmacotherapy gastric band gastric sleeve gastric bypass may still be there but cardiologist physician why should we care about obesity it creates lots of morbidity because of the morbidity trillions of dollars trillions of rupees are wasted new drugs have come we should use them gently but definitely with boldness and final overall strategy psychological intervention may work may not work pharmacology therapy does work bariatric surgery i have a question mark every time people tell me about that i remember bill roth surgery its history so now last two slides the first question what is the starting dose of oral semaglutide this is the answer so at least you have listened to my lecture or you already knew next question how does glp1 receptor agonist work and i have 2 minutes and you have 1 minute to slowly think of the answer so don't start the timer for another 10 seconds 15 seconds wait let everybody digest and then start the timer so don't press your button now wait let everybody read what i have written very important question and answer So A got it right. B, C, and D can always meet me during lunch time, and I'll teach you again. <laughs> so it stimulates insulin secretion from pancreatic B cells, inhibits glucagon secretion, slows gastric emptying. Thank you very much, everybody. This is a slightly different topic. You got to hear about sleep, uh, pharmacotherapy of that, obesity, and you heard Dr. Uh, Parikh say that we don't change our habits. So we're going to talk about something that you, a lot of you may not know much about, and the question is, are you willing to change habits? I have no conflicts of interest. So the first question. Uh, we have the ars working right so do any of you know either r or python a you never heard of them you tried to learn uh, or never tried to learn tried but it did not work um you've learned one or both of them or you are interested in learning all right i'm very happy to hear that um and, and i think uh, 0% have learned either one or both of them so the question is how many of us are young enough at heart and mind to start learning some of these things and why do we need to learn these so the first big concept you want to hear about and you know bioinformatics is such a vast topic and i'm going to talk about genomics tomorrow so tie this with the talk tomorrow to get the most out of it because i cannot cover all of it in 10 minutes but the i'll give you some big concepts and some vocabulary and then as you read more it will start making more sense so big data we live in an age of big data where does this data come from so in the us everything is in electronic health record. we'll talk briefly about what is called omics and what does omics mean and then everyone is wearing sensors we have diabetes sensors home blood sugars fitness trackers all that generates data and then there is research data so what kind of numbers are we talking about here so the human genome when it, you analyze it and sequence it generates 200 gigabytes of data one person one person there are billions of people in the world a small hospital systems electronic health record system 
generates many terabytes of data per year. And we have one million new publications in PubMed per year. All this leads to so much data and the human mind does not have the capacity to ingest all of this. So we need tools to help us make sense of this. And that tool, that field is called informatics. And what we, I'll just give you a brief overview of what this field uh, kind of covers. So here is what we have. We have uh, informatics in general, that is clinical informatics, bioinformatics, and then ways to analyze it. This is where R and Python come in and machine learning comes in. I'm not going to go teach you R and Python today, so don't worry. But we will learn about what comes under these different uh, topics. And the other big concept you will hear about is data science. How many of you have kids who are debating whether to become a doctor or to become a computer science person? Okay, a few. If they are interested, have them talk to me because you can't choose between the two now anymore. If you are a doctor, you're going to have to learn computing. If you are a computer science person, one of the biggest areas to go into is healthcare and data science. So this is traditional research, you know, if you are a computer science person and know stats, then you can do machine learning. And then if you are a computer science person and have domain expertise, you become an informatician, computational biologist, and the intersection of all that is data science. A person, a fresh grad out of college in the US makes over 200K in the first year, $200,000 in their first year coming straight out of college if they are a data science person. That's more than most physicians start off with. So let's take a couple quick examples. Uh, computer vision is a term you will hear about. What does that mean? It is a machine learning term. Just remember CNN. You will start seeing papers in regular medical journals. You already are to some extent. This is the algorithm used by which computers analyze images. All of you know that if you put an image on Facebook, it knows who it is. This is the same way that uh, it can be used in healthcare. If you or someone you know, or your son or daughter are in this field, it's going to completely change by the time they graduate. And it's because it's very heavily image dependent. So this is just an example we think you need a big degree to read echoes. This is a paper basically saying that computers can analyze the videos of echocardiograms and actually at least identify the problems so you know, physicians can then uh, validate it, but it picks up problems that physicians have a hard time picking up. And all of you know what ROC curves are. So when you have a number of one, where the curve goes all the way and has almost a right angle in the top left, that's a very good sensitivity and specificity. This is with two different data sets that it got the fantastic sensitivity and specificity, computers without humans doing this. So this is in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Switching gears, the whole genome, I talked about how much data there is. So when the Human Genome Project started in the late 1990s, it took over a decade to sequence one genome. So back here, it cost $100 million to sequence one genome. Now, the cost is like $700 or something. Tremendous drop. How fast is it happening? And like I said, it took decades. Now you can do a $100 billion base pairs in one day. So the speed has gone up, the cost has gone down, it's going to generate a lot of data. And then I said I'd tell you what omics means, right? So genomics is the study of DNA. I'm not going to go in depth today. The DNA gets transcribed to RNA and that's called transcriptomics. So people can sequence not just DNA but the RNA. The RNA becomes proteins and people can use mass spectrometry to study proteins. And the proteins work on uh, different 
they are enzymes, right? They can be hormones. So they run the whole body. And you can analyze the level of every chemical in your body. now. So what does all this mean? And this means that we are now going into the era of what is called uh, precision medicine or personalized medicine. So what is that? What is the impact of that? So we saw a couple of big trials, right? So we saw a trial of obesity drugs. How are they reported? They are reported for a sample of the population and are reported as mean weight loss. So the average person lost 20 pounds. Does it say 20% of people lost 0 pounds and 20% lost 30? If you read in the details somewhere it does, but a lot of them don't. And that is the issue is everyone is different. And when we study big populations, when you see a patient and you give them a medicine, Someone will have great effect with rebelsis and some will not. And you don't know that till you understand their body, their genomics, their transcriptomics, their proteomics. And the ability to do that is becoming very cheap and pretty ubiquitous. So we are moving from what used to be called evidence-based medicine to GBM or genomic-based medicine. And this is going to come very fast. It's already coming there in the US. So give you an example of a couple uh, things where uh, we see this. So one is medications. Um, it helps us predict which medication will work, which will have drug interactions. And I give you a question, it's not an ERS, but how many of you know that you can actually predict which person is going to need less or more warfarin to control to get anticoagulation? It's completely genomically determined besides that what they eat. And so this is actually part of the FDA warning now, to look at the genomic data before you understand how much to dose a person. Same thing with clopidogrel. Most of you know it interacts with omeprazole. How does that happen? Again, it's purely genomic. And it's also part of the FDA. So the genomic data, like I said, is so many billions of amount of code, but actual transcribed to RNA is only 2%. The rest of it is actually not, never transcribed, and we don't know what it does. But we are starting to figure out that people with the same DNA have different outcomes, and that is based on their lifestyle and their environment, and that is called epigenetics. So I'll give you one fantastic study. In World War II, for one year, there was no food in the Netherlands. Germany starved them. And what happened was they looked at the people who were in the utero at that time, not born, but in their, they were fetuses during that time. What they are finding now is compared to their siblings who were one year older or younger in the same family, even 70 years later, there is 10% increased risk of death in that group. And that is all because their DNA is the same, but the epigenetics has influenced and changed their data, the way their DNA works. So the person who is able to lose weight versus not may not be even their DNA, it's something else. Yeah, no. And then finally, I wanted to leave you with uh, some idea of what is called uh, uh, clinical research and pragmatic trials. So pragmatic trials are competing with... Uh, uh, randomized control trials and they have no inclusion or exclusion criteria particularly and the data is able to you're able to do is able to uh, produce studies like this in the Lancet which predicted the sensitivity of uh, high, uh, high sensitivity uh, troponin and uh, finally it, it is able to get us answers very very quickly this is all in the EHR in March of 2000, we had this question, are ACEs and ARPs bad? In May of 2000, we had a publication in JAMA with the end. So I wanted to leave you with this final slide that if you are interested, start learning. If your kid is interested, don't demotivate them, incentivize them to get into data science and work with healthcare because that is where all the future answers are going to be. We cannot rely on big RCTs to help the individual patient. So I'll stop there and thank you very much.
uh, an excellent lecture on data management. I am going to uh, explain how we can use this clinical data which we get from the ambulatory glucose profile in our day to day clinical practice. So, how we manage our diabetic patients? So, the, previously it was just the glucose control. Uh, we control fasting, we control post prandial we control HP1C, but from there with availability of newer medications like SGRT2 inhibitor, GRP1 analog, our focus has changed from just glucose control to the prevention of complication because now we have a medication which can actually prevent the long term complications which are related to diabetes and after all improve the quality of life of the patient. However, Still, when we are uh, using this kind of molecule, this newer molecule, still we need to get the sugars under control because all these molecules have the benefit beyond sugar control. If a patient is on SGLT2 inhibitor, if a patient is on GLP1 analog, but still his or her HP1C is not controlled, patient is not going to get all the benefits of that molecule and therefore still the glucose control should be the central part of the diabetes management. And how we evaluate this glycemic control of the patient. So the conventional method of this uh, uh, measurement of glycemic control is HB1C, the fasting, postprandial, this uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose. However, there are some limitations of this conventional method. Uh, like overall glucose control can be very well assessed with the use of HB1C. However, the SMBG profile, uh, especially when it is done very infrequently, it cannot give us the adequate data to, uh, to, to give us the idea that how the overall glucose controls are there. Apart from this overall glucose control, the prevention of hypoglycemia, how we can detect the hypoglycemia. HP1C has, has no ability to detect this hypoglycemic episode because it, it, it is an average of 3 months. SMBG, yes, it can detect hypoglycemia if it is done at the time of symptomatic hypoglycemia. And the third parameter that is glucose variability, how the blood glucose uh, levels fluctuate, both the SMBG as well as the HB1C has, has not ability to detect this glycemic variability. And why we require to detect the glycemic variability because here you can see there are two patients, patient A has, has, a, has a very smooth control, both the patient has similar HB1C level of 7.2. However, patient A has a very smooth glycemic control without major fluctuations and it, it, it is having very low glycemic variability and as compared to that there is a patient B who is having peaks and troughs of glucose variation which leads to the high glycemic variability and despite having a normal HB1C, patient will be having some of the complications related to diabetes because of this high glycemic variability. So, how, how we can pick up this glycemic variability in our clinical practice? So, uh, there are uh, uh, methods, with uh, uh, the, the instruments which are available, ambulatory glucose profile, continuous glucose monitoring, which can help us in picking up this glycemic variability, where these this, uh, 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 devices are indicated in, in all the patients still, we cannot uh, use this uh, ambulatory glucose profile. So there are few special indication in which we can we can use this uh, this technology. So the patient with type 1 diabetes who are not meeting HB1C target with recurrent diabetic ketoacidosis in those patients to fine tune the, the insulin uh, 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 therapy we can we can use uh, ambulatory glucose profile. Uh, the patients who are having repeated hypoglycemia or even a hypoglycemia unawareness. This is a very important indication in patients who are having frequent episodes of hypoglycemia or those patients who have developed hypoglycemia unawareness. In those patients, this, this <laughs> technology is helpful. Uh, when, when patients require good sugar control with avoidance of hypoglycemia like elderly patients, the patients who are having, having, having uh, uh, renal problem or liver problem who are at high risk of developing hypoglycemia, in those patients we can use this technology in pregnancy and even in those patients who are having brittle diabetes, who are having high glycemic variability, especially if patient is having, having a type 1 diabetes or a pancreatic diabetes, we see there is a large glucose fluctuations which are happening in those patients. To guide the better therapy, we can use ambulatory glucose profile. These are the devices which are currently available in India. The first one is the Medtronic device, this Guardian Connect. It is a real-time device with, with, with uh, 
compatibility with iOS and Android and it, it gives you the uh, alert whenever the blood sugars are falling below the target range or going above the target range. Another one is the Freestyle Libre uh, and the Freestyle Libre Pro. These are flash glucose monitoring system which gives you the graph of the emulated glucose profile. Uh, this this uh, when, when inserted this device when the sensor is inserted it measures uh, blood sugar level or the interstitial sugar level every 5 minutes over a period of 7 days or 14 days. So the Metronix device uh, measures sugars for 7 days, the, the Abbott device measures sugars for almost 14 days and the data which is collected it analyzed and it has been represented in form of a, a pictorial form. This is a summary of, of uh, ambulatory glucose profile report. What you should see in this, this report is the first how much time it has been used. So ideally it should be used for at least 10 to 14 days to give us a better idea or give it the adequate amount of data which can be analyzed. It also gives us the estimated HB1C, the estimated uh, glucose value also uh, has been given. The target range should be set by the uh, uh, clinician. It can be very majority of patient we put it between 70 to 180 however uh, depending on patient profile with, with a stricter glycemic control or less stringent glycemic control we can we can adjust this target range. The important one is the is the median. So the central blue line is the median line which is the uh, median of the whole data which is collected at particular point of time. And the other two important parameters are the interquartile range that is the 25th to 75th centile of the data on particular time and interdecile range. We will be going to discuss about this interquartile and the interdecile range in the later part. And lastly it also gives us the estimated glucose value as well as the how much time patient has spent in the target range as well as the time above as well as the time below range. So majority of time if we expect that patient if patient is uh, spending more than 70% of his time in, in range, then patient HP1C would be around uh, 6.5 to 7%. So how we uh, clinically utilize this AGP? So first of all, we need to uh, uh, set the goal of what we are going to achieve by, by putting a patient on an ambulatory glucose profile. We need to assess the quality of data. Again, sometimes we need to uh, recheck with the with the with the glucometer also to see the accuracy of the uh, ambulatory glucose profile. The adequate amount of uh, data should be scanned and an adequate amount of days it should be used. Also, this EGP report cannot be uh, analyzed without patient logbook. So, patient has to be keep a uh, good logbook of what patient has been eating, how patient is exercising. The first and foremost is we need to address the hypoglycemic episode as a priority. First, we uh, need to avoid any kind of hypoglycemia and later on, uh, depending on the patient profile, we can adjust the, uh, 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 adjust the pharmacotherapy or the behavioral changes will be required. Also, we need to evaluate for the day-to-day -day glycemic variability. So, how, whenever you see the AGP report, how you analyze the hypoglycemia? The first is the frequency of hypoglycemia. How many times the hypoglycemia are occurring the duration of hypoglycemia total time of uh, hypoglycemia uh, time which patient has spent the depth of hypoglycemia so for a normal patient we say the hypoglycemia is uh, defined as rbs below 54 but for a diabetic patient we keep it as a less than 70 however when patient is on agp again we can keep for diabetic patient also that uh, when profound hypoglycemia is defined as when uh, the blood sugar level falls below 54 and the period if there is any particular period so patient is having a more than five events of hypoglycemia in a night time so that is a high risk period if there are kind of this kind of zones are there when patient is having multiple episodes of hypoglycemia we need to intervene and we need to uh, uh, avoid the hypoglycemia. And now coming to the glycemic variability part. So the first uh, uh, in, the, in the first panel, you can see there is very low glycemic variability. There is a very small interquartile range as well as the very small interdecile range, and that is the ideal for the patient. The second panel, you see that there is a high interquartile range. So when the interquartile range is high, uh, then it, it it suggests that there is need for the treatment adjustment. Patient required to adjust the treatment for the uh, uh, decrease this interquartile range. 
and when the interdecile range is very high <laughs> and the interquartile range is very small, then it is a major problem of behavioral. So patient will need to have some lifestyle modification to reduce this interdecile range. And when both are high, we need to adjust both treatment as well as the behavioral therapy. Also, we need to understand that such there are some interfering substance like paracetamol has has effect or alcohol has effect on the metronomic uh, guardian connect as well as patients who are on high dose of vitamin C, it has effect on the freestyle regulate pro reading. So let us quickly go through a few cases. This is the first case. Uh, the only question is whether this patient will require a pharmacotherapy intervention or this patient will require behavioral changes. So here you can see there is a very small interquartile range and the interdecile range. However, there is a after breakfast there is one spike is happening. So this is how this AGP is helping the fine tuning of data. Here you can see the estimated A1C is 6.3 but still we can achieve something better because there is one spike of uh, uh, high glucose level after breakfast we can address with adding some pharmacotherapy intervention. Here you can see another patient, uh, patient is having a high interquartile rate, the patient is having fasting hypoglycemia, the nocturnal hypoglycemia is happening around 4 am, patient is on multiple oral antidiabetic agent and also patient is on basal insulin, however the daytime sugars are high. So this is a typical uh, AGP picture which you see in patients who are on steroids. So uh, when patient is taking one daily dose of steroid, the daytime hyperglycemia will be there and patient will be experiencing nocturnal hypoglycemia. So just by changing from basal insulin to the premix insulin before breakfast, we can address both of the problem. The daytime hyperglycemia will be covered and the nocturnal hypoglycemia can be reduced. And this is the, the worst kind of AGP you can see when there is a both interquartile and interdecile rate will be will be very broad and patient will require both treatment as well as the uh, uh, pharmacotherapy as well as the behavioral intervention will be required. And this is the ideal case scenario in which we can achieve a very smooth pattern. HP1C level can be achieved as good as 5.5% and uh, last slide the take home message is AGP is, is giving us a very good uh, diagnostic tool as well as the educational tool for the patient and with with analyzing the AGP, we can uh, provide patient a better uh, glycemic control and we can very fine tune the uh, uh, glycemic management. Thank you. Uh, I have no disclosures. I'll just be presenting a case of pulmonary nocardiosis. Uh, this was a patient, you know, she was a 62 year old female, a resident of Faridabad, who was admitted on the 2nd of November and she went uh, discharge and request on the 9th of November. She came with a history of shortness of breath for uh, for one week, which was initially on minimal exertion and subsequently at rest, and it, it had increased for two days prior to admission. She had high grade fever with chills and cough with expectoration and multiple oral ulcers because of which her uh, oral intake was very poor. And uh, the background history was that she was a poorly controlled uh, asthmatic and who was taking uh, steroids on her own. Uh, whenever she felt that she was breathless and uh, she would take nebulizations as well and would not follow up with the doctor regularly and she would only report to the hospital when her breakfast was not, was not controlled with uh, steroids at home. And uh, this was the initial examination. Uh, she had, did not have any pallorectris or cyanosis clubbing, uh, lymphadenopathy or pedilatima. The JVP was not raised. There was uh, oral candidiasis and the blood pressure was on the lower side. That is 90 by 60. She was having tachycardia and um, her temperature was 102. Um, and, uh, saturation initially uh, on room air on uh, the day of admission was normal. It, it, that is 98%. She was not a known diabetic but her sugar by, by, by glucometer on admission was 219. And uh, just uh, examination showed that there was decreased uh, air entry on the left side and she had bilateral bronchi and cardiovascular and the abdominal examination was normal. This was the uh, investigation pattern. Initially, uh, you can see uh, her hemoglobin was okay. Her counts remained normal and her platelets were normal. Uh, creatinine was normal. She had a, a slightly low sodium and potassium was normal initially and subsequently it was a little low. And uh, this is the initial LFT which was uh, okay. 
and uh, this was the initial um, we had sent her blood cultures which were normal till the end and she was detected to have uh, diabetes for the first time her hb1c was 8.3 we also did a cortisol levels because she had been abusing steroids frequently so we, we wished to find out whether she had secondary adrenal insufficiency which was not there and she had a urine examination which showed proteinuria and glucose urea but there was no uh, infection as such and this was the abg this was on the day of admission that is on the 2nd of november she was uh, she was having respiratory alkalosis because she had tachypnea tachycardia and she had she was febrile but she was uh, maintaining her saturation on rumac but subsequently on the 6th of november uh, she became uh, she had a fall in saturation to almost 88% on rumac so she we had to start oxygen on nasal bronchs and uh, this was the abg on that, uh, that day uh, this is a ecg which we did initially just showed sinus tachycardia no sdt significant sdt changes and uh, this was the echo which showed that her ejection fraction was normal there was no regional valve motion abnormality or any pericardial effusion or any intracardiac clot this as you can see was the initial uh, x-ray which showed a uh, consol area of consolidation in the left mid and lower zone and this is significant uh, because as we saw earlier her despite the high fever and this consolidation her counts were absolutely normal and uh, this was the repeat uh, chest x-ray after bronchoscopy on the 6th of uh, november which showed an area of consolidation with breakdown in the left mid and lower zone and radicular nodular opacities on bilateral upper zones and the left wow. cp angle was blunt so these are the CT scans. Um, the bronchoscopy she could not be done uh, initially because she refused for the procedure. We had to persuade her a lot. And uh, these were the CT uh, films that you can see. There's a uh, cavitating lesion uh, in the uh, uh, left uh, lower uh, low with an air fluid level. And uh, there were patchy opacities, uh, the space consolidation, ground glass attenuation in the left upper loop, as well as multiple tiny nodules in bilateral lung fields. The radiologist uh, reported that we should uh, rule out a fungal etiology. And there was no pleural effusion here. And uh, this was the sputum exam uh, test that we had done. The sputum, uh, since she, uh, her uh, TLC was normal, she was uh, newly diagnosed diabetic. Plus, she had been taking steroids a lot. Um, um, one of the first differentials was uh, tuberculosis. Although it was not an upper lobe involvement, but still uh, uh, considering the background, tuberculosis had to be ruled out. And sputum AFB samples were negative. Cram stain and gene expert was negative. Sputum culture she did not show any growth. So this was the initial hospital course. Uh, we put her on antibiotics and nebulization. Initially, uh, she maintained her saturation on Rumai. Subsequently, on the 6th of November, she uh, dropped, her saturation dropped and we had to start her on oxygen by nasal prongs. She continued to have fever despite antibiotics. We had to uh, give her uh, insulin for her sugar control and we replaced her potassium uh, because she had developed uh, hypokalemia during hospital stay. But she continued to have high fever. She, we had advised bronchoscopy but she did not uh, agree to it. Subsequently, she agreed to it and which was done on the 6th of November. These are the initial uh, uh, bal reports and then bal AFP, grab stain and KOH and gene expert when all was negative. Cytology did not show any malignant cells and uh, culture grew E. coli and pseudomonas which was ESBL and uh, the uh, the microbiologist rang, up, rang us up and then she told us that there were some thin filamentous branching acid fast structure uh, which, showed, uh, which was suggestive of nocardia and uh, she was the one who directed us uh, in the right direction and the fungal culture and the AP culture was negative. So the uh, culture grew nocardia after one week. And her other bowel reports were normal, the cytology, AFP stain, and the gene expert and the AFP culture and the endobronchial biopsy and the TBNA did not show any evidence of granuloma or uh, malignancy. So this was the bowel culture report. As you can see, we grew two ganisops, E. coli and pseudomonas, which was ESPR. These are the fever spikes that she had throughout her hospital stay. Uh, initially, we had given her Remoxic lab. Then, we, uh, on seeing the X ray, we, uh, we added clarithromycin and clindamycin to give her an atypical and an anaerobic cover, but she continued to have fever and her counts remained normal. We shifted her over to Miropinam, but the fever persisted. And then, uh, after she agreed for bronchoscopy, which was done, and the bowel, uh, once it, uh, the microbiologist informed us that the uh, bowel showed no cardia, we put her on um, Cotrimaxazole. And we monitored her kidney function tests and her counts. She uh, continued to receive nebulization and uh, 
antibiotics as and when required and uh, oral antifungal was added for a rural candidiasis. We also advised upper GI endoscopy because uh, we also thought she could probably be having esophageal candidiasis but she refused um, to get it done and after diagnosis of pulmonary coronocardiosis uh, it is mandatory to do neuroimaging to find out if there is any CNS involvement but she uh, refused for the same. And these are the pictures, the bulb pictures. Um, these are the modified ZN stain and the gram stain. There are thin branching filamentous uh, beaded structures on the gram stain. And this is the typical molar tooth appearance of nocardia on cultures. Uh, we gave her insulin to control her sugar short acting. So this is my final diagnosis. We diagnosed her as having pulmonary neocardiosis with a superimposed bacterial infection and uh, she had an acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. She was a newly detected diabetic uh, with a background history of chronic steroid abuse. She had dyselectrolytemia and oral candidiasis. We also suspected esophageal candidiasis which we could not uh, rule out because she uh, did not agree to the test. So, um, so, subsequently on the 6th of November, she wanted a discharge because of some financial constraints. So, she subsequently went to another hospital. We got to know later that uh, they had to continue the treatment for pulmonary neocardiosis. They did the CNS screening by an MRI, but there was no CNS involvement. And uh, I was told that she had improved a lot and her radiologically, all her, um, they had cleared a lot. And uh, she had been discharged on uh, um, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and was doing well. So, ideally, uh, what we should do is do a species identification and do a susceptibility testing. So, because uh, certain nocardia don't respond to some drugs, they respond to another, some drugs better. But um, there we could not do this because it was not available in our hospital. And uh, the uh, treatment protocol, uh, which, is, uh, one, uh, which is advised, is ideally uh, trimethoprim, sarbomethoprim, plays uh, is the backbone of therapy. Besides, uh, there are combination therapy of uh, amipenem, ceftriaxone, amikacin is also used uh, depending on the identification of species and sensitive, sensitivity uh, testing. Um, in case of a brain abscess, a surgery is also uh, advised if the lesion is large and if there is no uh, response to therapy after two weeks of uh, antimicrobial. So what are the risk factors where uh, conditions where you should suspect nocardiosis since we don't come across that on a regular basis and the patients who are immunocompromised, patients who are HIV positive or patients who have a chronic granulomatous disease, a post-transplant patient who is on multiple immunosuppressive drugs, a chronic alcoholic and a pulmonary patient who are having pulmonary alveolar proteinosis uh, is pr more prone to nocardia and many patients who have been using steroids for a long time, any patient who has a chronic lung disease and in the current scenario where, where rheumatologists use a lot of biologics and this is also very important that we think of uh, nocardia in such settings. Uh, so the synopsis of this case uh, of this case is that uh, nocardia usually affects the lung, brain and skin. These are the usual areas which are affected and in the lungs usually there is a, the, it resembles tuberculosis. So you can have an audular cavitating lung lesion, you can ha also have uh, brain, uh, brain abscess. So uh, brain imaging is advised in any patient who has pulmonary nocardiosis to rule out a CNS involvement. Ideally, um, uh, uh, species identification and sensitivity should be done by multi-test, uh, uh, test, but it is an expensive test and not very frequently available everywhere. So the take-home message is that nocardia and tuberculosis have almost the uh, a similar symptom profile. They can present as fever, uh, weight loss, loss of appetite, malaise. The radiological features could be similar. So, it, uh, but uh, uh, only the staining and a very um, diligent microbiologist will be able to point the way to you. And because the modified ZN staining with 1% sulfuric acid is done for uh, nocardia, whereas 20% is used for uh, tuberculosis, 20% sulfuric acid destroys nocardia. So you should inform the microbiologist if you are in case you are suspecting nocardia. And if you give them a good background history, they will be able to help you identify the organism and help you with the treatment. Thank you. Uh, we will go ahead with the latest pharmacological management of NAFLD NASH. As already discussed, weight loss, obesity, medications, uh, it is more of an obesity associated, excessive fat accumulation within the liver associated with insulin resistance. So when we call it as a fatty liver, whenever there is a more than 5% of fat in hepatocytes, we call it as a uh, fatty liver disease. We have to exclude 
we have to exclude secondary causes like viral infections and alcoholic fatty liver disease. It is a spectrum of disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis ultimately leading to fibrosis and development of cirrhosis. Early stage will be fibrosis F0, F1, fibrotic stage will be F2, F3 fibrosis and cirrhosis will be F4 fibrosis. Why this F1, F2, F3, F4? Because medications target that fibrosis reduction is there or not with the medication and definitive diagnosis of NASH requires liver biopsy and whatever medications we have that before starting ideally we should have a liver biopsy. What is the prevalence and incidence? Prevalence and incidence correlates or coincide with the obesity and metabolic syndrome. We all know western countries data says that 17 to 46 percent of the patients have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If we consider Indian scenario it is 9 percent to 35 percent have prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We always target obesity but mind that in Indian scenario we have lean NASH also. Patients have normal BMI, they are not obese but 7 percent of normal weight population have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and even they develop cirrhosis of liver over a period of time. Now it is a better to use the term non-alcoholic fatal liver disease instead we can say metabolic associated fatty liver disease because it all coincides with the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. Now before going ahead with the pharmacological management, there are FDA criteria or drug controller of India criteria which drug can be used for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. There are two criteria. First one is NASH resolution, second one is fibrosis improvement. There should be resolution of steatohepatitis on overall histopathological reading and no worsening of the fibrosis. One criteria is that more than one stage improvement in fibrosis stage without worsening of the steatohepatitis. These are the two criteria if fulfilled by any medication can be used for NASH. Now going ahead with the case, 45 years gentleman with diagnosis of fatty liver disease grade 2, no diabetes, no hypertension and he is obese. His liver function tests are showing SGBT of 100, SGOT 90, rest of the liver function tests proteins are normal, ultrasound. In ultrasound we have to see eco texture of the liver, here fatty liver grade 2 eco texture of liver was normal, normal portal vein and spleen was normal. So it is not advanced liver disease, viral markers negative, lipid profile was as correlating with the obesity, high triglyceride, high LDL level, elevated cholesterol and reduced HDL levels, HbA1c was normal, ANA profile was negative. So we asked for the fibrous. Uh, away leading fibrosis, we did fibroscan. Fibroscan value was 8 kilopascals. Instead, if this patient not responding to medication, we have to go for liver biopsy. This is a little earlier stage, we did fibroscan. Conclusion this is a obese, non diabetic, non hypertensive with normal viral markers, dyslipidemia, fatty liver grade 2, transaminitis that is elevated SGBT OT, high fibroscan value. Now, this is a high risk patient <laughs> ideally. So, treatment. Before prescribing medication, first ideal target is dietary and lifestyle modification, weight reduction up to 7 to 10 percent, ideal target more than 10 percent weight reduction, dietary consultation and review after 12 weeks. If patient follows dietary lifestyle modification and weight reduction is there, then we have to assess at 12 weeks, at the time also SGBT OT persisted to be abnormal, weight loss was 7 percent, continue dietary and lifestyle modification. But there was persisting changes so we intensified to do weight loss up to 10 percent or more than 10 percent. Now here comes the role of drug therapy because we have given an adequate time, 3 to 6 months of time and then also persisting abnormalities, transaminases. What are the drugs that we have at present for the NASH or NAFLD? We will go ahead and every medicine step by step. Statins. Statins are not studied specifically for NASH but most of the time due to dyslipidemia are used. Statins are uh, not of great advantage and most of the time people are worried whenever there are SGBTOT elevated should we use statins or not we can use they doesn't cause any harm to the liver and they can be used. UDCA that is also deoxycholic acid I can say after PPI most commonly abused medicine whenever people see abnormal SGBTOT UDCA is prescribed not approved, no improvement in mass is there, no improvement in liver fibrosis, not recommended, we should not waste money. Vitamin E, vitamin E is antioxidant, may be considered for the treatment of biopsy proven NASH in non-diabetic individuals, dose is 800 mg per day, that causes improvement in liver histology in NASH but it does not cause improvement in fibrosis, 
Long term safety concerns are always there regard related to prostate cancer and development of cerebral thromboembolism if we are using longer term. It is not recommended in diabetic patients, not recommended in a patient with Nash cirrhosis and patient without proven liver biopsy. More data is still needed. Insulin sensitizers, metformin and pyoglitazones. Everybody, uh, if always is there, let us prescribe metformin. Metformin has little evidence of histological efficacy of efficacy of improvement. Not recommended for treating Nash in uh, adult patient. Improved serum amino transferases and insulin resistant, but does not cause significant improvement in histology in Nash or fibrosis. Pyoglitazones, we have a Landmark trial, P1 trial that is bioglitazone, placebo, vitamin E, it causes improvement in Nash. Uh, that is PPAR, gamma agonist, bioglitazone is better than placebo, can be used in diabetics and non diabetics, improves histological features except fibrosis, so we can use it. This is the data that shows with bioglitazone in Nash patient without diabetes, there is significant <laughs> improvement in steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis. All three criteria, there was improvement. And pyoglitazone in Nash patients who are pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, 8 months outcome also says there is a statistically significant improvement in Nash improvement. There is resolution of Nash, but there is little evidence to support fibrosis improvement. GLP-1 agonist and SGLT-2 inhibitors, these are two diabetic medications, but can we extrapolate data to use that patient in di non-diabetic patients? We already have learned that liraglutide, semaglutide, that causes weight reduction. Ultimately, NASH is associated with weight gain, so weight reduction definitely helps. But we do have data scarcity that I can say that we should use our data. Any guidelines do not recommend to use that in a, just blindly. It definitely causes improvement in triglyceride level, it reduces liver fat content and it reduces ALT levels. But all these medicines do not cause any improvement in fibrosis. These are the trials, data phase 2, phase 3 trials. Uh, there are the trials are still underway. They all support that there is significant improvement in a fat Nash resolution with semaglutide. And there is improvement in a mean change in a weight. Significant improvement is there. There is change in a ELT levels that is improving. But uh, to recommend blindly is I do not recommend that. SGRT2 inhibitors also suggest that liver fat composition is reduced with these medications and there is reduction in ALT level. Yes, we can say if there is weight reduction, there is mass resolution. Ultimately, why there is fibrosis? Because of inflammation. If we control this metabolic milieu, definitely on long term that will reduce fibrosis and development of cirrhosis. So, we may have data in recent future within 2-3 to three years that even non-diabetics we can use this. Now comes the FXR receptor agonist. We all have heard obetic folic acid. Obetic folic acid is a very well proven now as per regenerate trial. It is a landmark trial, randomized double blind placebo control trial with more than 4 years of data or 1000 people. It's 25 mg once daily obetic folic acid causes more than one stage reduction in fibrosis from F3 to F2, F2 to F1. Treatment emergent side effects were pruritus in 52% of the patients well controlled with antihistaminics. Early modest elevation of LDL level was seen at 18 months of data but that returned to normal within 12 to 16 months of time. So, obesity folic acid is proven. We should use whenever there is a biopsy proven fibrosis F2, F3. We are, I recommend data also recommend now. PPAR alpha gamma agonist we all have heard saroglitas are used for diabetic dyslipidemia. This medication is improve, is causing improvement in ALT level, liver fat composition, reduces insulin resistance, atherogenic dyslipidemia improvement is there in FLD NAS, but not approved for by FDA for NAS per se use, approved by Indian Procurement Controller for NAS bariatric surgery. As Dr. Parikh Parik sir said that they are going to be obsolete in maybe whenever medications are available, but still when dietary lifestyle modification and pharmacotherapy doesn't work, bariatric surgery definitely uses uh, is useful for reducing weight and overall metabolic inflammation, metabolic milieu con changes can happen. So reduction in weight and metabolic complications are prevented. Stable results on long term. 
these are the medications they are in phase 2 phase 3 trial there are lot of medications <coughs> like already mentioned few medicine we will have in near future medication that will be helpful in reversing fibrosis so the term that were we were using that cirrhosis is a progressive uh, irreversible that reversal will be achieved in near future hoping for that so take home message is all the fat or fatty liver is not pathological there is a benign steatosis is there not all the fatty liver patient need pharmacological therapy do not forget to immunize your patients with NAS for hepatitis B dietary and lifestyle modification and reduction is must for NFLD in NAS pioglitazone and saroglitazone are good options for NAS improvement obitipolic is acid is the only medicine that can reverse fibrosis we should use whenever high risk patient is there GLP-1 agonist and SGLP-2 inhibitors can cause weight reduction and thereby improve national diabetics. Thank you. Today I am going to talk about a very basic topic but it is a very very important and underused tool in our today's clinical practice that is role of urine analysis, the liquid biopsy of kidney. So whenever a patient comes to us in nephrology, we assess these things. So this uh, investigations we look for the clearance, the GFR, the intactness of the blood urine barrier in the form of proteinuria and we see the cells in the urine that is sediment. This has not been changed in the last 20 to 30 years. We still do the same thing. In this, the most important thing is urine analysis. It is one of the oldest laboratory procedures of the uh, practice in medicine. It is a key test to evaluate kidney and urinary tract disease. Advantages are it is a very simple test, painless, non-invasive, inexpensive and rapid to perform. We can do it in our OPDs also. It is If performed properly, we can get very important information precise enough to consider the urine as a liquid biopsy of the kidney. The indications of urine analysis are in certain kidney diseases like glomerulonephritis, kidney failures, both AKI and CKD, pyelonephritis. UTIs, metabolic disorders like diabetes mellitus, uh, detection of jaundice which was done, uh, done previously, plasma cell dyscrasia like multiple myeloma, diagnosis of pregnancy, screening of drug, drug abuse. Uh, so this is very important. We should uh, instruct the patient for proper specimen collection. There are many loopholes like uh, there could be problems in the collection, in the transportation, in the storage and that alters the urine examination results. So we should advise the patient for proper washing of the hands in external genitalia and patient should have a midstream sample to avoid contamination. A patient who are having indwelling urinary catheters who are uh, hospitalized, a recently freshly produced urine sample should be collected directly from the catheter tubing. Urine uh, samples should be examined immediately ideally within two to four hours and if we are anticipating if there is any delay in the examination then the sample should be refrigerated at plus four to eight degrees celsius patient should be advised to avoid the strenuous physical activity in the previous 48 hours otherwise it may give false uh, uh, positive proteinuria patient may have transient proteinuria and also female should be advised to avoid sample collection during menstruation these are the basic parts of urine examination, the physical examination, chemical examination and microscopic examination. The physical characteristic includes the color. Normally the urine color is pale yellow to amber in color. There are multitude of abnormal colors due to pathological condition, drugs and foods. Purple color can, is very much uh, uh, diagnostic of porphyria. Brown color can be seen in certain uh, antibiotics. Orange color we see in rifam if the patient is taking rifampicin in dehydrations. Red color is seen in hematuria. Uh, turbidity. Normally the urine is transparent. We can see turbid urine if the solute content of the urine is high. If there are lots of pus, protein or RBCs in the urine, then the urine becomes turbid. Next comes odor. Pungent color uh, odor is seen in UTI. In DKA patients, because of ketones, there is sweet or fruity odor. In certain diseases like methyl syrup urine, there is methyl syrup odor, phenylketonuria, there is mousy odor. Next is specific gravity. It reflects the ability of the urine to concentrate or dilute the urine in relation to the plasma 
normal is 1.01 to 1.040. We generally overlook this information, but this is very important and it helps in differentiating pre-renal and renal AKI also. In pre-renal AKI, the specific gravity is high. In generally renal AKI in ATN, it is low or normal. Next comes the chemical characteristic. It is done by dipstick examination. It, it can be done uh, in an OPD basis or also we advise the patient to do it at home. In our uh, nephrotic syndrome patient and minimal change disease patient, we provide this dipstick at home and they check the dipstick for the protein and it is helpful in the follow-up and the uh, management of nephrotic syndrome. These are the paper strips impregnated with chemical reagents which are chromogenic. It has advantage of very, it is very simple, rapid and has low cost. But the disadvantage is it is a qualitative or semi-quantitative result only. First is in the dipstick we see for pH. Normal pH ranges from 5 to 8.5. Low pH is seen in metabolic acidosis with high protein means and volume depletion. High pH is seen in renal tubular acidosis type 1, vegetarian diets and infections with urease positive organism. Then it can detect glucose, it can detect hemoglobin which can be seen in hematuria, hemoglobinuria. RBCs are falsely positive in myoglobinuria and UTI. So if any patient comes to us with isolated hematuria then it is difficult to say whether the uh, cause is urological or nephrological. So for that we have to see the color. If the color is bright red then mostly the cause is urological that is the blood is coming from below the kidneys. And generally glomerular origin hematuria causes a smoky brown or cola colored urine. Clots may be present in extra glomerular hematuria. Proteinuria is significant in glomerular origin of hematuria. RBC morphology is very important to differentiate the, both the causes. Dysmorphic RBCs are seen in glomerular hematuria and RBC cast are also present in glomerular hematuria. Next is protein. There are different methods to detect protein in the urine. First is albumin dipstick. It is sensitive to albumin and it has a very low sensitivity to other tubular proteins and other light chain immunoglobulins which are seen in myeloma. Uh, Microalbuminuria as we know, it is the presence of albumin in the range of 30 to 300 mg per 24 hours. It uh, identifies the diabetic patients who are at increased risk of developing over diabetic nephropathy. The dipstick gives the result in the form of trace plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4. As you can see, the plus 4 results signifies that there is more than 1 gram of protein in the urine. It does not tell us that it is nephrotic range proteinuria only. So, for proper quantification, we have to do a 24 hour protein excretion test. It is the gold standard method and it quantifies all the proteins. Next is urine protein creatinine ratio. It can be done in a random spot urine sample. It is an alternative to 24 hour urine collection because 24 hour urine collection is cumbersome method and cannot be, uh, it is not possible to do in all the patients. So there are numerous causes of proteinuria but uh, the common causes that we see in nephrology are minimal change disease, membranous nephropathy, FSGS, MPG and IgA nephropathy and the secondary causes are diabetic, uh, diabetes mellitus lupus nephritis, amyloidosis. There are tubular interstitial diseases also um, in uric acid nephropathy, acute interstitial nephritis. Uh, there is proteinuria but the proteinuria is less than 1 gram per day. The next test in deep stick is leuco leukocyte esterase. It detects the presence of pyuria. Then there is nitrite. It detects the gram negative bacteria that reduces nitrates to nitrite. There is detection of bile pigment, then there is detection of ketones which is present during diabetic ketoacidosis or during fasting, vomiting or after strenuous exercise. The next is urine microscopic examination. It provides a window into the kidney. This is the method how it is done. Urine is centrifuged, it produces a sediment, then it is taken on a glass slide and it is examined under the microscope. A number of cells are seen, most important is RBC. As we have discussed, uh, there are two types of RBCs seen. If the RBCs are isomorphic, that is they are having regular shapes and contours, then the RBCs are derived from the urinary tract 
and if they are dysmorphic, then if they are having irregular shapes, then the origin is glomerulus. <coughs> Next cell is WBC. Neutrophils <coughs> are seen in UTI, acute interstitial nephritis, and it could be contaminant also. Eosinophils are very non-specific findings. It can be seen in acute allergic nephritis, glomerulonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis, schistosomiasis. Lymphocytes are seen in uh, cellular rejections, diluria, macrophages are seen in active, uh, acute glomerulonephritis. <coughs> then there are renal tubular epithelial cells which we frequently see in acute tubular necrosis, acute interstitial nephritis, transitional epithelial cells, this suggests the origin is, the damage is in the uroepithelium. So they are seen in urological diseases. Lipids are very much specific for proteinuria. Cast, they are specific, they are cylindrical structures that are formed in the lumen of the distal renal tubule and collecting duct. They are formed from 10 horsepower glycoprotein. They are very much specific that the origin is from within the uh, kidney. There are different types of cast and it has different significance, highly, highly granular or benign. Granular cast are seen in acute kidney injuries, vexi cast are seen in CKD. Erythrocyte cast is seen in glomerular hematuria and glomerular nephritis. Uh, this myoglobin cast is very much specific for rhabdomyolysis. Then in clinical practice we see light chain uh, uh, cast in, my, in, in uh, multiple myeloma. Next is crystal. Crystals are formed due to supersaturation of particular solute in the urine. It gives us information about the stone disease, rare inherited metabolic disorders like tyrosinemia, cystinuria and uh, it is also useful in certain drug toxicity like in patients who are taking acyclovir, indinavir, sulfur group of drugs. <laughs> the crystals can be normal or can be pathological. So uh, how this examination is useful in our uh, kidney patients? So these are the positive findings in the urine in case of nephrotic syndrome. We have a protein urea that is plus 4. Urine protein quantification gives more than 3.5 gram of protein per day. The fatty particles of the lipid cast is very much specific for nephrotic syndrome. RBCs may be absent in case of minimal change disease or it could be moderate in case of FSGS or membranous nephropathy. In nephritic syndrome, protein urea could be there. Glomerular hematuria is very much specific for it. RBCs are moderate to high in number, so that is plus 3 or plus 4. RBC will be there in the urine report. Dysmorphic RBCs will be present. Ideally, if it is more than 40%, then we stamp it as glomerular hematuria. RBC cast will be present. In patient with infection, acute pyelonephritis, the urine analysis will show leukocyte esterase positive, nitrate positive, hematuria may be present, but the RBCs are isomorphic. Urine culture is the gold standard test for pyelonephritis. So to conclude, urinary cells are useful in differentiating different disease entities. Urine microscopy offers a glimpse in real time into the anatomy and physiology of kidney disease. And despite the advances in today's clinical practice, the history, clinical findings and the skilled examination of urine by a physician or a nephrologist should be done before stamping the diagnosis. So it is about saying to know your patient, we should know his urine. Thank you. Today I am going to talk on clinical approach to pleural effusion. As we all know that pleural effusion is a common uh, diagnostic problem and dilemma while in our OPD practice as well as the indoor practice. Um, today's my lecture is just to renew the old things and revisit the old thing that we have learned in the past. So basically we are, uh, when that patient came with pleural effusion, the basic evaluation is history taking, basic blood investigation, X-ray chest, sonography of the thorax to identify the amount and uh, presence of fluid and adhesions, CT thorax to identify any parenchymal problem, 2D echo to evaluate for any uh, heart failure and diagnostic and therapeutic pleural fluid aspiration if required. So if you characterize the pleural fluid, it can be either transudate or exudate. Transudate happen because of the imbalance in hydrostatic and oncostatic pressure like consistent cardiac failure and exudate is because of the varied lesion. If you are getting any transudative fluid or any clinical suspicion of transudate, it need not to be aspirated. If we clinically strongly say that this pleural effusion is 
appear to be transudative, it need not to be aspirated. But if you feel that it is not a transudative, then it must be aspirated for uh, identification of the cell, proteins and other parameters. Now these are the several causes of transudative effusion that always cause a transudative effusion like basal atelectasis. Sometime in ICU patient we see atelectasis along with a small amount of pleural effusion which is caused by the increased intrapleural negative pressure or CSF leak, heart failure which is commonest reason for a transudative pleural fluid, hepatic hydrothorax. It is rare without clinical ascites which is very important if the patient came with a chron uh, chronic liver disease and not having any ascites and having pleural effusion, it is a different pathology than the uh, hepatic hydrothorax. Hypoalbuminemia, iatrogenic like misplaced CBP catheter, nephrotic syndrome, usually it is a subpulmonic and bilateral. Any uh, chronic renal disease uh, with a fluid overload always have a bilateral pleural effusion. Peritoneal di dialysis, acute massive effusion developed within 48 hours of initiating dialysis. Urinothorax, it is caused by the inspiratory obstruction, obstructive uropathy or by hydrogen injury. Now if I aspirated the fluid and you evaluate by color, pale yellow color is a, always present in transudate and some of the exudate may have pale yellow color, so it is sometimes misleading. Bloody color in malignancy, benign asbestos effusion, post cardiac injury syndrome or wrestle syndrome which we commonly see at Sims hospital. Pulmonary infection in absence of trauma, chylothorax is found in white, you will get a milky effusion, brown effusion, if there is any long standing bloody effusion, a chronic hemothorax and if you aspirate it, it looks like a brownish color fluid or rupture of amoebic liver abscess into the pleural cavity. Black color is found in fungal infection like aspergillosis, metastatic melanoma, pancreatic pleural fistula, some of the malignancy and esophageal perforation. Yellow is green color, slight green color fusion find in rheumatoid pleurisy, dark green in bilothorax means there is a biliary leak into the pleural cavity and sometimes you find the same feeding uh, color has come into the pleural space so probably your enter tube has been entered into the pleural space. Now gross appearance of the pleural fluid again, character, characteristic of the fluid if it is a viscous it is more likely to be mesothelioma. Uh, debris are present in rheumatoid pleurisy, turbid uh, fluid present either there is a synneumonic effusion, uh, paranemonic effusion or empyma, encovy in amoebic liver abscess and if you uh, have a smell, smell looking like ammonia it is a urinothorax. Now what are the lights criteria? We all know this light, lights criteria second, uh, since our second IBBS date. So traditional lights criteria rule if at least one of the three criteria fulfilled for fluid is defined as exudate. So there are three criteria, uh, any uh, one of should be present to identify it is the exudative effusion. First is the pleural fluid protein upon serum protein ratio which is more than 0.5 or pleural fluid LTH upon serum LTH ratio is more than 0.6 or pleural fluid LTH is more than two third of the upper, upper limit of the laboratory's normal LTH because you don't have uh, this uh, serum value then you have to assume that this is a normal, this is a higher level of the LTH level and it should be two third of the level. Now coming to a very interesting case, uh, this is a uh, uh, Mrs. ML, patient was living at Singapore and recently shifted to Ahmedabad and she is living alone along with a caretaker. So nobody was with her and she was presented to Marengo Sims Hospital. She was non-hypertensive, non-diabetic as per the accompanying person. Uh, presented with restlessness and exertion since last two months and gradually increased to MRC grade 3 since last week, one week. And when she was presented, she was orthopnic, much restless, tachypnic, tachycardic, hypertensive. X-ray chest and USG thorax was done immediately. It was suggestive of bilateral moderate pleural effusion. Routine blood investigation, RFT, LFT, serum protein, everything turned out to be normal. 2D echo suggests concentric LVH and LV ejection fraction was 55%. There was my DMR, my TR. CT scan was also done immediately. It suggestive of bilateral pleural effusion with atelectasis and there were changes suggestive of pulmonary edema. We took the opinion of cardiologist Dr. Chug has seen this patient and he strongly said this is not looking like a cardiac pleural uh, effusion. Even though the CT scan is suggestive of uh, congestive changes and bilateral pleural effusion, but he strongly denied that it doesn't look like a cardiac effusion. 
we have aspirated the fluid. So 1.5 liter of fluid was aspirated from the right side. And this is the analysis. The protein was 2.83, glucose 1.43, albumin 1.68, and ADA level was 8.6. So it was looking like a more of a transudative effusion. The cellularity, lymphocyte 80%, polymorph 20%, cytology was negative for any malignant cells. Gram stain, ZS stain, culture, everything turned out to be negative and gene export MTB was negative so tuberculosis also virtually ruled out because ADA is also negative and gene export also negative so there was a dilemma why there is a bilateral gross pleural effusion uh, both the side pleural aspiration was done and each side around 1.5 to 2 liter fluid was aspirated for 2-3 times and then eventually we put a, a both side ICD insertion because continuously it was draining and patient was very much uh, breadless by the time when the patient become in a reasonably clinical stable, we evaluate the history because there was nobody with her. Uh, she uh, took out a bottle from her purse and she said she is taking this medicine since almost more than 2-3 uh, years. And uh, then we came to note that she is a case of a chronic lymphoid leukemia since many years and she was being treated at Singapore. And she was taking this tablet Desardinib since few years. Hematologist opinion was immediately asked and uh, uh, he opined that it may be desertinib induced pleural effusion. So the medicine was withdrawn. Gradually the pleural uh, fluid output from the ICD uh, reduced and we were able to uh, remove the ICD tube by 20 to 25 days. So this suggests the importance of history taking any unidentified medicine that patient is taking and which may lead to uh, pleural effusion. Patient absolutely fine after uh, desertinib was discontinued. So, in history taking, always look for nitrofurantoin, amiodarone, and ovarian stimulation therapy, which is being used for infertility, may also lead to bilateral pleural effusion. There are immunotherapy related pleural effusion, occupational exposure like asbestosis, systemic disorder like lupus, amyloid, yellow nail syndrome, and high IgG4 level also uh, lead to pleural effusion. To look for extra pleural sources like ascites, urinary tract obstruction, and hepatic and pancreatic disease. So these are the some of the uh, pathology which may have transudative or may have exudative pleural effusion. So these are the processes that may cause transudative effusion but usually it causes an exudative effusion. But if you find a transudative effusion you can't rule out this pathology like amyloidosis, chylothorax, constrictive pericarditis, it might have uh, bilateral effusion, uh, sometimes it is a transudative, sometimes it is exudative. Uh, then malignancy, pulmonary embolism may have dual type of uh, pleural effusion, it may have uh, transudate or it may have exudative, sarcoidosis, SVC obstruction and coronavirus disease also sometimes found to have a transudative pleural effusion. These are the long list of uh, causes of exudative pleural effusion and uh, these are the bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, so many uh, fungal infection, subphrenic abscesses. Sometimes it is a result of a iatrogenic or trauma. There are several drugs like nitrofurantoin, dendrolin, desartinib, amiodarone may produce pleural effusion. And sometimes lung entrapment lead to increased negative intrapleural pressure and accompanying pleural malignancy or inflammation. And certain connective tissue diseases like lupus, mixed connective tissue disease, rheumatoid arthritis, which are the most common causes of connective tissue diseases leading to pleural effusion. Very important is a pleural fluid DMINS level because measurement of ADA may be helpful to distinguish between malignancy, malignancy and tuberculosis effusion because it is a daily dilemma that is a malignancy or tuberculosis. So lymphocytic exudative pleural effusion with initial cytology smear and gene export MTB negative and if ADA comes between 35 to 50 it is most likely to be tuberculous pleural effusion and if it is less than 40 it reasonably uh, suggest that it is no, there may be confusion between 35 and 40 so you have to be in dilemma but if it is more than say 50 you can reasonably assure that this is a tuberculous pleural effusion uh, similarly if it, you find neutrophilic predominant pleural effusion with elevated ADA level so in that the radiology will helpful if you find nodular lesion on the chest X-ray or CT scan it supports tuberculosis while intrapleural loculation which present in a paranemonic means pneumonic effusion. Sometimes there is a dilemma in pneumonic effusion whether to start TB treatment or not to start TB treatment. So in this manner it can be distinguished. Pleural fluid cytology overall sensitivity is 60 percent 
and sensitivity may increase by 50% when second thoracocentesis. So if you aspirate the fluid second time, the sensitivity may increase. No single fluid, fluid biomarker is accurate for sutrin use in diagnostic evaluation. Another case, this is a, another interesting case who has recurrent fluid effusion. Uh, in that case, uh, everything was done, we were not able to identify the reason and uh, plural fluid cytology, culture, gene expert, ADA, everything turned out to be negative and uh, he has recurrent plural fluid aspiration. He was aspirated uh, several times and uh, this is a pleuroscopic uh, uh, medical thoracoscopic biopsy was taken. You can see there are several additions and there are the pleura looks uh, uh, slightly signing pleura which may suggest uh, presence of uh, mesothelioma. In this, this patient medical thoracoscopy done and multiple additions seen with sinic pleura, multiple pleural biopsy taken. Histopathology was suggestive of suspicious for mesothelioma and further evaluation was not done as patient was not much willing to go for PET CT and other evaluation. Thank you very much. Who must have used aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, rightly so, I don't say they were wrong. Uh, of late, the evidences are going against, but let me take you through the journey that how the aspirin has evolved for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease and how, what is the situation now. Ever since mankind has been there on this earth and maybe for the last 70, 80, 100 years, we have started recognizing that heart attacks, strokes and death because of that is increasing. We always wanted to prevent heart attack and stroke and that's why we started using aspirin. So before we go into the discussion, let me put a case. A patient who has come for health checkup, health checkup has been completed, has been uh, in front of you now. Mr. Gentleman, 65 years, retired army man, no history of cardiovascular disease so far, no family history of premature cardiovascular disease, quite active as per the age. Blood pressure is upper range, 134, 78, no history of hypertension, sugar is normal, LFT, RFT, okay. Total cholesterol is 175, LDL cholesterol is 115, HDL cholesterol is 38. He smokes two cigarettes a day, very disciplined in smoking, he says, for the last 40 years. No history of bleeding in past. Complete blood count, hemoglobin 14 gram, total count 7,500, blood blood is okay. So your option and question is, you take your voting pets. I will start a small dose of aspirin, 75 to 100 milligram per day. And option B, I will not start aspirin. So, majority of you do say that he doesn't need aspirin, but there are few people who say he needs aspirin. So yes, that is a point to make. So now, whenever you think to use aspirin as a primary prevention, even for the secondary prevention, dose has to be small between 50 to 100 milligram. Why? We know that aspirin is COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. When you give aspirin in small dose, it predominantly works on COX-1 receptor, which are situated in platelets and it starts producing reduction of production of thromboxane A2. So that's where it is anti-platelet. When you give higher doses of aspirin, more than 100 mg per day, it also starts working on COX-2 receptors, which leads to reduction in synthesis of prostacycline and that's where the adverse effect and problem start. So always be careful, whenever you have to use aspirin, it has to be between 50 to 100 mg per day. That is something which is important. Now, why aspirin, which was extremely favored drug before so many years and is now becoming out of favor? And if you look to the newspaper of America before two, three years, the New York Times said that aspirin used to be prevent, to prevent first heart attack and stroke should be curtailed. That is what US panel said. And they said that a patient where you use aspirin for primary prevention may face serious side effects in terms of bleeding. So why this conclusion changed, that is because of these last three trials which are done extremely well in very relevant patient population. When you want to use aspirin for primary prevention, you would like to use and test aspirin for people who have got diabetes because you know that diabetic people have got higher risk of heart attack and stroke. Second trial which was aspirin which was on senior citizens, as you know that as the person ages, goes more than 60, 65, 70 years, his or her risk of MI and stroke increases. So that's why they tested this molecule in people who are more than 70 years of age. And third point is, maybe patient is reasonably young, maybe patient has no diabetes, but a patient has got multiple risk factors like smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, hypertension. So that is high risk situations. In that, again, they tested aspirin. So aspirin was tested in these three trials in three very relevant population, diabetes, senior citizens and people who have got high cardiovascular risk. So what did the first trial which was done in diabetes say? More than 15,000 patients lasted for more than 7 years and aspirin 100 milligram per day was given. If you look to your extreme left, 
there was 12% relative risk reduction in the serious vascular event. That was MI stroke, transient ischemic attack and cardiovascular death. There was a significant p-value. So yes, in people with diabetes, when you give aspirin, it does reduce risk of MI stroke and death because of that. But if you look to your right hand, it also leads to 30% increase in major bleed. This we are not talking about circuitous bleed or epistaxis or gum bleeding. This is major bleed. It means patient would bleed either into brain, ICH, patient would bleed into GI tract, patient would bleed into critical organs, needing admission, dropping HP by 3 gram, needing 2-3 PCB. So these are major serious bleeding. So what was found is on one side there is a modest benefit, on the other side there is a big cost to pay in terms of bleeding. Second trial which was done in senior citizen, again 20,000 patients aged more than 70 years, 100 mg aspirin. In this trial, again if you look to your left side, reduction in risk of MI stroke and cardiovascular death, not significant. While increase in bleeding was significantly there and there was a, there was a truth established before this trial by meta-analysis that if you give aspirin, it reduces risk of certain cancers like colorectal cancers. But in this trial, which was done in senior cities, and it was proven that even aspirin doesn't lead to reduction in cancer death. In fact, in this trial, there was increase in risk of cancer and death because of cancer. And the third trial, that is aspirin in people who have got high cardiovascular risk because of multiple risk factors. Look at here on your left side, more than 12,000 patients, they had multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. A trial lasted for five years. What was the finding? Again, no benefit in terms of cardiovascular death, MI and stroke. But yes, there was increased risk of bleeding. So what these three trials say to us? The benefit in terms of reduction in risk of MI stroke and death is less modest and inconsistent. While if you look to the penalty which you have to pay to get aspirin is consistent and strong. So every trial did keep on saying that it increases seriously risk of major hemorrhages either into critical organ or brain. So why these statements are getting changed? Because if you look to the previous days, before 25-30 years, when most of you are seniors here were practicing and giving aspirin, that was an era where perhaps lifestyle modification was not as well discussed. That was an era where other risk factors were not treated to the target. That, that was an era where blood pressure 150-160 was acceptable. While in today's world we are chasing blood pressure more seriously. That was an era where diabetes was not well treated because of the lack of medicines and molecules. Now we are treating diabetes well. And that was an era where statin was not used, either statin, statin was almost practically not there, now statin is there. So in an era where lifestyle modification is there, in an era where smoking and tobacco is attacked, in an era where blood pressure diabetes is reasonably well controlled for majority, and in an era where statin is well used, people have now got less residual risk, and if the residual risk is less, aspirin is not going to work, rather it is going to produce problems. And this is what has been suggested by various meta-analysts, but let me give you a wonderful statistics. This was a meta-analysis produced in Journal of American College of Cardiology, aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular events, 15 randomized control trials, more than 160,000 patients. And what was suggested? See, they made a statistics which is very important. So when you treat 263 patients, when you treat 263 patients for one year, you prevent one risk of MI stroke and cardiovascular death. And on the other side, when you treat 222 patients for one year, you induce one major bleed. So roughly equal number to treat or equal number to harm. When you treat 250 patients, you are going to say one MI and stroke, you are going to produce one major bleed. So it's a trade-off between saving ischemia versus giving bleeding. So when you want to think on aspirin as a primary prevention, the most important point is you have to understand that it's a trade-off between prevention and between doing some harm. So, whom to prescribe aspirin as a primary prevention? The answer is, whom not to prescribe. So, first point which you as a physician should remember is, which are the patients where you should not think of giving aspirin as a primary prevention? Number one, first assess the risk of a patient. If the risk is low or moderate for future cardiovascular event, there is no role of aspirin. So, patients should have very, very high future risk. Say, for example, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, premature family history of disease, if you have a whole bunch of 5-6 risk factors, you can still think of, number one. Number two, anybody and everybody who is more than 70 years, you should not think of aspirin because as the age increases, the bleeding risk exponentially increases. So if at all you want to think aspirin, the age has to be less than 70. And third point which is very important, anybody and everybody whose bleeding risk is high, you should not think of aspirin. So how do you assess the bleeding risk? Very easy, age more than 70 years, low body weight less than 50 kg frail, 
low platelet count less than 1 lakh, low hemoglobin less than 10 gram, past history of major bleed spontaneously, past history of ICH, past history of major GI bleed. So these are all points which do suggest that patient has got high in this. So somebody who has got low to moderate risk is out, anybody more than 70 years is out and anybody who has got high bleeding risk is out. Now there are two areas where aspirin for primary prevention can be helpful. These are suggestions. There are no randomized controlled trials done, but these are estimated benefits. Number one is those people who have got elevated lipoprotein A. So those who have got lipoprotein A more than 50 mg, they are the probable candidates where you can think of aspirin as a primary prevention. And second is, which is very important, if your patient has got CT coronary artery calcium score, this is one area. If it is more than 100, aspirin for primary prevention can help. <coughs> Between 1 to 100, again there is a clumsy zone, but more than 100 the patient does get benefit. So if you have a patient which I described to begin with, then you can send such a patient for CT coronary calcium score. And if calcium score is more than 100, you can think of aspirin. So coming to sort of conclusive slide, my ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, if I have to give you a simple answer, and if you want only simple, clear answer, aspirin for primary prevention is out. It's a high time to get divorced from aspirin as far as primary prevention is concerned. So get rid of that idea. Healthy lifestyle. I mean, we all know that changing human behavior is very, very difficult, but keep talking to your patients, but your patients would believe you if you are doing yourself. So start changing your lifestyle so that you can influence your patients. Control the risk factors to the supreme target. Don't be satisfied if BP is 140-90. You have to get BP to less than 130-80. LDL cholesterol to less than 70 and glycated hemoglobin to less than 7 for primary prevention. If you still want to use a medicine, use one medicine with blind eyes and that is statin. So when you want to think primary prevention, think of statin, get rid of aspirin. Aspirin should not be thought. Aspirin should never be prescribed for someone who is more than 70 years, low cardiovascular risk and high bleeding risk. And still there are people who would say that and it's by idea of okay, aspirin, what will you percent? Then consider aspirin for anybody and everybody who is young, 40 to 60 years, not after 65. High cardiovascular risk by multiple risk factors, low bleeding risk. And you need to talk to the patient that by giving you aspirin, I am going to reduce your risk of MI stroke, but I am going to give you a risk of bleeding. What patient prefers? It's very, very important. There are patients who are more feared of MI stroke, they would accept aspirin. There are patients who are more feared of bleeding, they would not. So talk to patient because when you prescribe aspirin for primary prevention, you are not helping the patient on one front, that is bleeding. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Today is bleeding management of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is uh, like very common in day-to-day -day practice and it affects every specialty, be it general physic general practitioner or physicians or specialists. So all should know what is the present scenario of tuberculosis in our country, what is the current guideline for treatment, what is the incidence of drug resistance in our country and based on treatment uh, should be decided. So it is a case-based discussion. Uh, Current status of TB, to eliminate it is a tough task because uh, we contribute around 28 lakh patients which contribute to around 25% of global burden of tuberculosis and the number of MDRTB is also very high in our country. It is around 1 lakh 24,000 uh, and it, it comes to around 9.1 per lakh population. Now case 1 is a male patient Aged 25 years, presented with complaint of low-grade fever, cough, with expectation, weight loss since 20 days, X-ray chest showing left upper lobe cavitating lesion, no past history of pulmonary TB or AKT. Uh, and based on this, it is a suspected case of pulmonary TB. This is his X-ray chest. Now, what will be the most appropriate action? A. To start AKT. B. To stand sputum for ZL stain. C to send sputum for AFB culture, B send sputum for smear microscopy, gene expert and AFB culture. Uh, but the correct answer is to send sputum for microscopy, gene expert and AFB culture. So why to send every patient for gene expert? Because gene expert gives you diagnosis of tuberculosis also and at the same time it is a diagnosis, it gives diagnosis of rifampicin resistance which is a surrogate marker of drug resistant tuberculosis 
and eighth ki culture is required because it is a gold standard for drug sensitivity so based on that later on we can put the sensitivity is patient is not responding so the answer is uh, sputum for microscopy gene expert all things should be sent because the drug resistance is very high in uh, new case it is around 22% among new cases and 36% in previously treated any drug resistance not recombination and mdrt is around 6.19% overall now which regimen will you start 2 shrz 4 hr 2 herz 2 herz 4 hr 2 shrz 4 hr 2 shrz and 4 hr See WHO recommends uh, 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 a regimen, but in our country, two HERZ plus four HER is recommended because India has got high INH resistance. Eleven percent in new cases and twenty-five percent in previously treated cases. So, if you give two drugs only in continuation phase, so around twenty-five, eleven percent patients in the uh, in the new cases will be exposed. to single drug which can lead to drug resistance so it is all it is in india it is recommended to use three drug in continuation phase now case two a female patient aged 50 years of dry off and on since last four years before say seven years she had complete uh, she had pulmonary dpn akt was completed for six months there was no reports of the no reports were available now she presented with complaint of cough dry and low grade fever since last 15 days and she is not producing sputum this is her x-ray chest showing uh, uh, both side cavitating lesions with right lung destruction now what will be an appropriate action now to start akt as it is a known case of pulmonary tb and most likely a case of relapse of pulmonary tb and go for bronch or and or b option go for bronchoscopy and bal examination to confirm microbiological diagnosis so your answer is correct go for bronchoscopy and bal examination and for microbiological diagnosis because let us see this case we did bronchoscopy and bal for aerobic culture fb culture and gene expert bal was negative for gene expert but positive for sudden stage this happens when the patient when patient is having ntm infection so this patient had uh, uh, was was having ntm infection and culture was positive after 18 days and on speciation it turned out to be mycobacterium cancerosus which is one of the three common pathogen mycobacterium avium complex mycobacterium abscessus and mycobacterium cancerosus these are the three top ntm organisms and ntm infection is is common in previously immunocompromised lungs like patient is having uh, cavities due to old tuberculosis or patient is having bronchiectasis then this patient uh, having ntm infection and these are uh, like treatment is different as compared to mycobacterium tuberculosis so correct diagnosis and speciation is very important now case 3 a male patient aged 35 years uh, uh, known case of pulmonary tb since last 2 years he defaulted with akt twice now he came with complaint of fever cough and weight loss since one month and his sputum amp is positive for tb and recombination resistance is detected so now what will be your action to start without drugs to do further molecular test to detect any drug resistance to send afb culture and and p both b and c so the answer is both b and c why uh, both is required because you in drug resistant tuberculosis you need to right uh, like diagnose the drug resistance pattern early uh, and start early treatment you cannot wait for cultures but culture is required to corroborate the evidence correlate the drug resistance pattern which is detected by molecular test so which are the molecular test which you can do is either line probe assay or gene expert now gene expert uh, line probe assay is available for first line and second line drugs and gene expert is available for mdr and hdr tb both answer is both b and c
सो लाइन ड्रो वैसे और फर्स्ट लाइन इट डिटेक्स रेजिस्टेंस अगेंस्ट रिफॉर्म बीसी ओनली एंड रिफॉर्म बीसी एंड आईएनएच लाइन ड्रो वैसे जीन एक्सपर्ट डिटेक्स ओनली रिफॉर्म बीसी रेजिस्टेंस एंड सेकंड लाइन एलपी डिटेक्स रेजिस्टेंस अगेंस्ट फ्लूरोक्विनोलॉन एंड सेकंड लाइन इंजेक्टेबल ड्रग बट द ड्रॉबैक ऑफ लाइन ड्रो वैसे इज दैट इट द रिपोर्ट इज अवेलेबल इन अराउंड 48 आवर्स Whereas gene expert detects uh, gene expert MDR and XDR. MDR detects resistance to rifampicin. It does not detect <coughs> resistance to INH. Gene expert XDR XDR detects resistance uh, to INH, fluoroquinolone, second line injectable drugs, and ethionine in a single test. So patient, if patient is having drug sensitive TB, for example in uh, MTB rifampicin MTB detect and rifampicin in cell is sensitive, then you need to check for INH resistance. in uh, in uh, rndcp program they they do uh, first line uh, uh, first line lpa to detect inh resistance in our practice we can use first line lpa or gene expert xdr anything we can use so the treatment of mdr and xdr tb is also uh, gone uh, like change significantly for uh, now with vid- advent of bidabelin the, re- the response rate of drug resistant tuberculosis is very good the shorter regimen uh, is also available for uh, <coughs> drug resistance that is 4 to 6 months previously patients required to have uh, like 2 uh, to 2 and 1/2 years of mdr tb treatment with 6 months of injectable now injectables are totally out it it can it is used very rarely sparingly when other drugs are not available so shorter regimen available uh, for the patients who are not exposed to drugs or exposed to less than 1 month are 4 to 6 months of bidacilin uh, levofloxacin clofazimin pyrazinamide ethambutol high dose inh and ethanamide followed by continuation phase of 5 months that is levofloxacin clofazimin pyrazinamide and ethambutol so the treatment maximum duration is 11 months and response is very good we'll see in next slide some patients require longer regimen those who are exposed to uh, these drugs then this patient required 18 to 20 months but here also injectables are not required levofloxacin bidacilin bidacilin is usually 6 months and uh, linozolid clofazimin and cyclosporine so linozolid is, is very important bidacilin and linozolid are very important drugs for treatment of mdr tb here you can see bidacilin is a wonder drug for particularly mdr tb patient you can see the response rate which was previously less than 50% it was around uh, uh, 35% it is around 71% as compared to non bidacilin based regimen which is 29% so always use bidacilin whenever possible the only drawback is bidacilin is not available in open market patient has to go in rndcp so nowadays we refer our lot of patients Uh, to RNDCP program, patients who want to take treatment from us, we write down uh, letter to RNDCP. They will provide us. They provide us. Patient will continue treatment with us, but they will provide bidacilin to the patient. But it is it requires a letter of pulmonology. Thank you. So I am going to overview the drugs which can safely be used in the pregnancy. we all know that pregnancy is a very much physiological condition and whatever drugs we want to give during the pregnancy that has to be safe so before i start the drug we should know what are the categories of the drug on the drug box you will find some category like category a a is absolutely safe any uh, any drug can be given which fall in category a category b c and d to be given only if there is a clear cut benefit versus the risk so if there is a benefit you can give to a pregnant lady but category x means it should not be given at all it is very harmful and uh, the hemodynamic changes during the pregnancy start right at the fifth week of conception and uh, that increases throughout the pregnancy there are a lot of changes which happens uh, during the pregnancy and of course the outcome of the pregnancy again depend upon the baseline cardiac status so if you see this figure is this table there are lot of changes heart rate increases significantly stroke volume increases cardiac output increases systemic vascular resistance decreases significantly almost 40 to 50% of uh, magnitude so 
imagine if the patient is not hemodynamically stable if she become pregnant how much the hemodynamic burden she can tolerate so it's very difficult situation so pregnancy is uh, if uh, occur in the very like a hemodynamically compromised or hemodynamically unstable lady that's going to be create a havoc so you have to be very careful what subsets of patients what patients are coming to you because the blood volume which increases significantly start rising from the fifth week onward and almost there is five to six times increase in the blood volume you can imagine and there is significant decrease in the systemic vascular resistance so any stenotic lesion which worsens the further the resting heart rate increases 10 to 20 and the cardiac output increases almost in the tune of 50 percent so you can imagine that a patient not a patient but a woman who is hemodynamically stable but having the cardiac problem which is at the borderline so whether she will be able to tolerate pregnancy or not and not only that during the labor because of the uterine contraction anxiety and pain there is a further increase in the oxygen consumption there is further increase in the cardiac output increase in systolic and the diastolic blood pressure so will your patient be able to tolerate all these hemodynamic changes that is a question and you have to advise the patient accordingly and not only during the delivery, after delivery also because there is significant increase in the venous return because of the removal of the fetus and there is significant shifting of the blood from the uterus into the systemic circulation there is significant increase in the venous return there is a further deterioration or further hemodynamic burden on the heart so during pregnancy, during delivery and the postpartum period they are very hemodynamically, very sensitive periods so one has to be very careful about uh, how to manage all these things so, special cardiac test, whenever required, we can advise like ECG is absolutely safe. Echocardiography is very un underused, I believe. Because any patient which is having some hemodynamic problem, you should advise the echocardiography. MRI is not usually indicated, but uh, if required, you can safely do during the pregnancy. Some patients who have a borderline hemodiagnosis, even we can monitor the pulmonary wedge pressure or pulmonary catheterization can be done safely. And if indicated only, cardiac catheterization should be indicated and we can do it also safely. X-ray should be advised only if you think that that X-ray is going to make a difference in your treatment part. Otherwise, don't advise X-ray to a pregnant lady. And always, whenever, whatever radiological investments you are advising, just you have to keep in mind whatever the consequence of radius on the fetus as well as on the mother. So, based on all these parameters, we can divide the patient either patient fall into low risk category like shunt, shunt lesion, AST, VHT, PDA, they are very safe, the patient can have the pregnancy on this shunt lesion. Those with the class 3 to class 4 mitral stenosis with the stenotic lesion, uncorrected quantum, atrial fibrillation patient, they fall into the medium category and those patients with having severe pulmonary hypertension, Eisen manger, coactation of the aorta, valvular stenosis, marfan, they fall into very high risk category and this category of the patient we should not advise them to continue the pregnancy but just to terminate the pregnancy and termination is best before the 8th week and require if indicated suction evacuation should be done over the MTP. So wherever you feel that patient belong to high risk category advise the medical termination of the pregnancy and these are the clear contraindication for the pregnancy severe hypertension, obstructive lesion, AS, PS, severe mitral stenosis, DCMY, coactation, systemic uh, LV dysfunction, history of previous uh, uh, postpartum cardiomyopathy. these are special clear contraindication for the pregnancy. So any patients coming, pregnant lady coming to you with this thing you should directly advise against the pregnancy. And uh, symptoms of pregnancy, signs of pregnancy very much resembles the cardiac symptoms and signs. So you have to be very careful what uh, patient whether is having cardiac problem or not. So echocardiography is very good tool to rule out the cardiac problem. So one by one I will just evaluate the valvular disease, prosthetic well. If you combine this, uh, see the valvular heart disease, CHD patient, DCM patient, uh, the regurgitant lesions are very well tolerated, stenotic lesion class 1 and class 2 can be very well tolerated but class 3 and class 4 symptom patient we should not advise for the pregnancy and asynotic congenital heart disease pregnancy is very well tolerated and again as I said previously the uncorrected synotic heart disease, DCMY patient, stenotic lesion they will not tolerate the pregnancy. Digoxin, Lenoxin can be given safely, diuretics should be avoided but yes if required fusamide can be given and avoid giving the spironolactone, uh, amyloride, potassium sparing diuretic, beta blocker can be given but avoid giving the high dose of beta blocker especially adenolol should be avoided, calcium channel blocker can be given but most of the time I have seen the physician giving the uh, calcium channel blocker for control of the heart rate 
heart rate control is never indicated in the pregnancy because it's a totally physiological tachycardia so you should not control the heart rate with giving the calcium channel blocker and ac inhibitor and ARBs are absolutely contraindicated during the pregnancy coming to prostatic valve because pregnancy is a one condition where there is already existing hypercoagulation environment or milieu in the body so if patient is on warfarin just continue the warfarin don't stop the warfarin at that point of time because warfarin embryopathy is almost 5% not or less than 5% and if any lady with prostatic valve want to be pregnant, there can be three regimes. Either the patient can continue the warfarin throughout the pregnancy or the second regime then the initial period there can be the low milk heparin followed by the warfarin and then during the delivery time they can switch over to the warfarin again low milk heparin. And third subsets of patients they can continue the unfractionate heparin. But if you see the maternal mortality and the valve thrombosis which is the highest if you want to give unfractionate repairing or the low milk repairing throughout the pregnancy. So right now it is not indicated if your patients with prosthetic valve want to get pregnant just advise them to continue the warfarin and just switch over to the low milk repairing just at the time of conception and at the time of delivery. Because fetal complication is almost the same if you see all the three regimes but maternal complications are more if you give the unfractionate heparin and the low milk heparin throughout the pregnancy. So warfarin embryopathy yes it happens but it happens in less than 5% of the patients and good thing is that those patients with the warfarin requiring less than 5 mg the embryopathy is almost negligible and those patients require warfarin more than 5 mg the embryopathy is almost 5 to 9% of range. So you have to very selective recommendation is that uh, your patient is on warfarin just continue the warfarin just during the organogenesis time initial 12 weeks you can give the low milk heparin and at the time of uh, uh, delivery you can just switch over to the low milk heparin otherwise just continue the warfarin throughout the pregnancy. Coming to the eye profile axis if you want to give eye profile axis give ampicillin 2, 2 gram before the procedure with gentamicin and half dose of ampicillin after 6 hours of procedure. Those who are allergic to penicillin can be given vancomycin, clindamycin plus gentamicin combination. Hypertension almost 10 to 12 percent of the pregnancy complicated by the hypertension. If you don't treat the hypertension then you can have the eclampsia, preeclampsia, hepatic, acute renal failure and the abrasive placenta. So management of hypertension is very very important during the pregnancy. Coming to the medicine part, methyl dopa can be given safely, even the moxidine uh, can be given safely during the pregnancy. Central acting drug clonidine can be a drug of choice during the pregnancy. Beta blocker as I said should be given but in the low doses and etanolol should be, uh, should be avoided and uh, this uh, non-selective beta blocker again is a good drug of choice during the pregnancy. Alpha blocker can be given, calcium channel blocker, hydrolyzing all things can be given during the pregnancy but what I would suggest better to start one drug with the high dose to start the two medicine with the lowest possible dose. And diabetics again it's a contraindicator should be avoided as far as because it causes the uh, reduction in the placental circulation and of course AC inhibitor ARV should be definitely avoided during the pregnancy. Coming to CAD part uh, most of the time in the pregnancy you won't see a atherosclerotic disease you will see the spontaneous dissection. So any patients coming to with a myocardial infarction you have to look specifically for the dissection and uh, if patient is coming with ST elevation MI you can thrombolize the patient. I have one care, one patient in my career who I'm thrombolized with the streptokinase but yes streptokinase does not cross the placenta but you have to be very careful because bleeding risk is always high. Those patients present with the non ST elevation MI this patient can be managed with the uh, just medically and if required PCI only with the high risk category PCI should be done. So aspirin can be given safely, clopidogrel is safe, ticagrel are possible, we do not have uh, like uh, evidence right now so it should be avoided. Unfractionated repairing LMWH can be given safely, thrombolysis can be done. Statin should be avoided during the pregnancy because it's a category X drug. It should not be given in a pregnant lady. Beta blocker, calcium channel blocker uh, can be given but ARBs and AC inhibitors should be avoided in the pregnant lady. Again one more uh, just slide with the pregnancy, uh, the pregnancy is the statin falls in the category X means any pregnant lady or even it's a recommended the patient with the child wearing age. Statin should not be given because uh, it causes the severe fetal complication. Coming to the arrhythmia part, just cardioversion if required can be done, but you have to monitor the fetal carefully. IV sotralol, propionamide, amidron can be given. Again, metoprolol, propionolol, verapamil can be given. And if indicated, uh, ICD can be implanted, but better to implant before the pregnancy. But if required during in, uh, pregnancy also, it can be done. So, just my uh, one question here. 
the pregnancy is associated with discourage uh, pregnancy usually discourage in which of the following condition I think most of the people have given the right answer, but yes, any stenotic lesion uh, pregnancy should be avoided. Moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension contraindication for pregnancy. Patient with the marfans or alert dialysis contraindication for pregnancy. And patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. The second question: Which of the following medication is not preferred in the treatment of hypertension in pregnancy? Yes, wonderful. So, AC inhibitor and ARB are absolutely contraindicated during the pregnancy. So, last and final question. All of the following medications can be given to a pregnant woman with CAD except Wonderful. Thank you so much. Time is life. A concept that stays at the very heart of the practice of emergency medicine and especially when we are dealing with life-threatening conditions like shock, where it becomes all the more imperative to rush against the clock in order to save lives. And in order to do so, in today's era of new age healthcare, we are seeing a shift from empirical medicine towards evidence-based medicine. On that note, a very good morning to all of you. I'm Dr. Ayushi Choksi, and today we shall be focusing on the transition from a one-size-fits-all approach towards a more tailored and targeted approach towards dealing with undifferentiated shock. So to begin with, let's consider a case presentation. So we have a 60 year old male patient who presents to us with acute onset of shortness of breath and chest pain. He also happens to have a history of fever with multiple episodes of diarrhea vomiting. On examination, your patient is tachypneic, hypoxic, tachycardia, has hypotension, peripheries are cold and his overall sensorium is somewhat lethargic. Classical case of shock, right? So how do we approach this patient? We give fluids, we give vasopressors, we give inotropes, we give antibiotics or we give a cocktail of all of the above. Alright, so majority wants to manage with fluids and the rest want to give a cocktail of all of the above. And that's right because we don't know what we are dealing with so this is how we would traditionally manage this patient. Hopefully by the end of the session we'll have a different take on this. So to begin with let's first understand what we mean by the word shock. So by definition it's basically a state of circulatory insufficiency that creates an imbalance between the tissue oxygen supply and the demand which ultimately results into an end organ dysfunction. So as we all know grossly shock can be classified into hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, obstructive shock and distributive shock. To see a bit in detail, when we talk of hypovolemic shock, we know that we are dealing with either GI losses in the form of diarrhea vomiting or we are having traumatic cases where we are losing blood and there is a hemorrhagic loss or we might be seeing loss of fluid into the third space in the form of viral infections, fevers or in cases of burns. The basic pathophysiology here is that there is a decreased preload which means there is a volume loss or a volume deficit. Talking of cardiogenic shock, we know that there could be acute coronary syndromes or acute heart failure, arrhythmias, valvular dysfunctions or cardiomyopathy which might be causing the shock. But here the underlying pathophysiology is decreased contractility. No issues with the preload or afterload, just that the contractility is failing. Talking of obstructive shock, we know that we are dealing with life-threatening conditions like tension pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade. In all cases where the issue is increased afterload, thereby causing a resistance to the circulation. And if we talk of distributive shock, basically the systemic vascular resistance is reduced causing peripheral pooling like in sepsis, anaphylaxis or neurological shock because of spinal injuries. So here the problem is with the decrease afterload. So as you can see all four kinds of shock they have different etiologies causing them. So more often than not the problem that we face in the ED is that we always have a case of undifferentiated shock and to know the exact etiology behind it we need to have an interplay of the targeted history, the complete clinical presentation, lab investigations, radiological investigations. But to put together all the pieces of this puzzle we need few hours of time which might be detrimental for our patient. And in the AR, as you know, time is life so we need to capitalize upon the gold hour. So we need something which is very easily available and which gives us the answer within a matter of few minutes that what could be the possible etiology and how we can make the prognosis better by selecting the definitive direction of treatment. <laughs> 
So as we saw, all four kinds of shock, they had different etiology. The hypovolemic was having a decreased preload, cardiogenic had a uh, decreased contractility, distributive had decreased afterload, and obstructive had an increased afterload, thus leading to increased preload. So traditionally, our approach to this has been one size fits all. We treat all kinds of shock in the same manner, but now, in today's era, that is no longer acceptable. So the first step is that we need to accept the fact that yes, one size does not fit all at all, right? So we need to know that there needs to be a tailored approach or a targeted approach so we identify the specific etiology behind it and treat it along that fashion for a better prognosis. So now to understand this, we need to understand a very basic concept. So just imagine that the building here is your body and we need to make sure that water reaches everywhere in the building, meaning that blood reaches perfectly throughout the entire body. So there is an underground tank here which houses the water. There is a pump which works round the clock to take that water from the tank and take it through the pipes and deliver it to the entire building. So medically to correlate, the tank refers to the preload, the pump refers to the contractility and the pipes, they refer to the afterload. So when we talk of organs, the pump component is formed by the heart, the tank component is formed by the pulmonary area, the abdominal compartment and the IVC and the pipes portion is formed by the aorta and the deep veins. So by having a point of care bedside ultrasonography in the emergency, we can scan the pump, tank and the pipes as a part of a protocol known as the RUSH protocol and that will give us definitive clues which will help us identify the specific etiology. So how do we know that? So here is a small mnemonic, HI, here is the map for finding the direction of approach, HI, MAP, H for heart, I for IVC, M for Morrison's pouch or the EFAS, A for aorta and P for the pulmonary component. So seeing in detail, if we talk of the heart, so if we are scanning the heart which forms a part of the pump component, we put a parasternal long axis view and we discover there is a lot of fluid around the heart which is not allowing the heart to contract properly plus it is causing a collapse of the right sided chambers. So we understand that oh there might be the possibility of a cardiac tamponade suggestive of an obstructive shock. We look at the short axis view and see the ejection fraction going on the lower side or we see a regional wall motion abnormality, we understand that oh there might be an underlying cardiogenic shock in this case. Or we see an apical four chamber view and we see that the RA and RB are dilated as compared to the left side. We know that there is a right sided strain on the heart, probably suggestive of a pulmonary embolism, again leading towards an obstructive shock. Next if we scan the IVC, we all know that there is a normal respiratory variation of the IVC but in certain cases we might see that the IVC is completely collapsing or kissing in that manner which indicates that there is a volume loss in the body and there is a volume deficit. So basically this patient needs fluid or blood whatever the patient is losing. In this case if you provide vasopressors you are not helping the patient no matter how much you increase the afterload as long as there is no preload the patient won't improve. Similarly, if the IVC is plethoric, you understand that there is a lot of fluid in the compartment already. Providing fluids to this patient to increase the BP will only be detrimental for the patient and it is not going to help. So the IVC scan will also help you know that whether you need to treat with fluids or not. This forms a part of the tank component. The next would be the Morrison's or the EFAST. Now EFAST is a very accepted terminology when we are talking of trauma patients but it is equivalently important for medical cases as well. So when you scan the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant and the pelvis, you might be able to see some free fluid. That indicates a volume leak. Now there could be a ruptured triple A or there could be an ectopic pregnancy or there could be uh, just third space pooling because of disseminated sepsis. In all cases where you know you are losing the fluid and it is collecting, so you know that the treatment for this particular patient is to replenish the volume status. Again this forms a part of the tank. Talking of aorta, our main vessel which forms a part of the pipes, we have to scan for two main things. Number one, you scan for dissection. So if you can see a free floating flap in the aorta or if you are able to make out a, a true lumen and a false lumen, you know that you might be dealing with a possible underlying cardiogenic shock. In cases of AAA, you might be able to visualize the AAA on the ultrasound and if there is presence of free fluid along with it, you know that there might be a leak and you might be dealing with a potential hypovolemic hemorrhagic shock. And similarly, if you scan the deep veins and you find a thrombus, it may give you a possible etiology about leading to pulmonary embolism. Again, the aorta and the deep veins form a part of the pipes. And lastly, we see the pulmonary component, which uh, we have to scan for three things. Number one, we look for pneumothorax. So if we see a barcode sign or a lung point, which might indicate an obstructive shock, if we look at the lung field and we see bilateral B lines or pleural effusion on both the sides, we understand that there is a volume overload in the pulmonary component, again which might give us a hint regarding a possibility of a cardiogenic shock. So by looking at the pulmonary component, we are scanning the tank. So 
by these five components we are scanning the pump tank and the pipes so as we saw earlier we had four kinds of shock and they had different etiologies now with the help of the rush protocol if we were able to pinpoint the etiology we know that the treatment differs so if we were dealing with a hypovolemic shock you know that you have to replenish the volume status fluids or blood is the answer dealing with a cardiogenic shock you know you need to provide an anotropic support to the heart Dealing with a distributive shock, your SVR is down, you need to increase that up, so your vasopressors need to be your drug of choice and you can provide an antibiotic cover for the sepsis component. And for obstructive shocks, you know that the answer is to ultimately treat the cause. So if we are able to pinpoint the etiology in the first quote, we are able to treat it better in a specific manner rather than a one-size-fits-all approach and that is ultimately going to help the prognosis of the patient. So on that note, let's review our case again. Please have your voting pads out. Again, I'll talk again. So we had a 60 year old male who presented to us with acute onset shortness of breath and chest pain. Happened to have a history of fever and multiple episodes of diarrhea vomiting. On examination, the patient was tachypneic, hypoxic, tachycardic, had hypotension, peripheries were cold and his overall sensorium was somewhat lethargic. So now how do we approach this patient? But here the only difference is we did have focus by our side. We were able to perform the rush protocol and these were the positive findings. There was severe LV dysfunction, bilateral B lines were present and the IVC was plethoric. So now how do we treat this patient? What's the treatment of choice? We give fluids, we give vasopressors, we give inotropes, we give antibiotics or a cocktail of the above. No, we still do not need to treat with a cocktail of everything of the above. So basically let's try and understand what happened here was that yes, he did have a history of fever with multiple episodes of diarrhea and vomiting which might confuse you to think that fine, we are dealing with sepsis or we are dealing with a hypovolemic shock but ultimately that is what caused probably an infarction and which led to acute heart failure. So what your patient has presented to you with is acute cardiogenic shock because your findings are consistent with that. If you end up giving fluids to this patient, you will deteriorate the patient and you will never know when your patient might actually end up even in an arrest. So in this case, you first need to supplement the inotropic action of the heart because you're dealing with a cardiogenic form of shock. See, that is where your rush protocol is helping you that you are cutting down on the large amount of time that you are taking to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and then treat. The obvious choice in the initial instance would have been to give fluids but if you end up giving fluids in this case, you will be deteriorating the patient. So let's make use of this protocol to help us guide and find a direction as to what we are treating. So on that note, my take home message is just that until now we were using a one size fits all approach but instead of that, let's welcome a paradigm shift towards a more tailored and targeted approach so that we are able to identify the exact etiology of the shock and then treat it in that fashion especially while we deal with undifferentiated shock. Having said that, at no point does focus supersede clinical expertise and acumen. It is only an invaluable adjunct in the emergency room as we are racing against time. But clinical expertise will always stay above it. On that note, thank you so much for a very patient hearing. So I, in the next 12 minutes, we just have an overview about the endovascular treatment which we are doing in the neuroscience field. Uh, so it's a sub a specialty branch where we are dealing with the neurovascular disease of the brain. In uh, acute stroke for the large vessel occlusion or middle vessel occlusion, MD, mechanical thrombectomy is a standard of care now. Okay? And the second, uh, the aneurysm. In the most of the world, nobody is doing the clipping now. So everybody where the money is not a matter significant, the coiling is the treatment. Third, the AU malformation or any malformation related to the uh, brain which we can deal with the endovascular treatment. And uh, uh, sometimes we embolize the tumor also, so surgeon can better operate the patient with the less amount of the blood loss. And the last, most of the CBT uh, patients, they respond very well with the anticoagulation, particularly heparin. Only 5% of the patients, they need aggressive approach. And one of them is an endovascular treatment. So you all know the stroke is uh, two types, ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic is around 85% and hemorrhagic around 85%, uh, 15%. Uh, most common hemorrhage in the brain is happened because of the high blood pressure. But around 30%, this is may happen because of the aneurysm, which may rupture, maybe because of avium, maybe because of dural fistula, 
which can be taken uh, care by the endovascular approach. And the last is the TIA, transient ischemic attack. The most common cause of transient ischemic attack is the endovascular uh, atherosclerotic artery disease of large arteries of neck and brain. And these TIA have the high chances of recurrence because here is treatment is not just antiplatelet. You have to do something else, either CE or uh, stenting. Now coming to the ischemic stroke part, acute stroke treatment is to open up the artery within a time. Early, better is the outcome. Now we have the two treatment. One is a thrombolysis, which can be given up to four five hours, and thrombectomy up to twenty four hours. So window is extended for thrombectomy up to twenty four hours, and uh, it's a good results. So we have the pathway for the stroke patient reaching to the emergency. If patient reaching in the four point five hours, IV thrombolysis. On NGO, if, it's a, if it is a large vessel occlusion or middle vessel occlusion, shift the patient to the cath lab to open up the artery. If patient coming within 24 hours and after 2.5 hours, uh, 4.5 hours, then for the large vessel occlusion or MBO, directly cath lab. If patient comes beyond 24 hours, then we treat the complication which is likely to happen in the next 4 5 days. We want uh, to treat the patient should not have the recurrence of the stroke. So this is the way we are treating the stroke right now. What is the meaning of the large vessel occlusion or medium vessel occlusion? So uh, uh, yeah, internal carotid artery, MC, MC bifurcation, vessel artery or articular vessel system. These are the large vessel or medium sized vessel occlusion where uh, MT mechanical thrombectomy is advocated. So this is the case, uh, see presented with the uh, uh, right MCA stroke. So you can see the dense MCA sign, this is the early sign and uh, anybody can pick up. Otherwise it is perfectly normal. And uh, so we shift the patient to the directly cath lab. Uh, there was a contraindication for the IV thrombolysis, you will see this in half an hour. And uh, this MC was totally blocked and we placed a stent over here. and. Uh, Remove the clot, this is the clot, and the artery is opened up in one pass. And you can see there's nothing down upon that subsequent CT scan, and patient improved on paper. Another patient with a left MCA stroke, global aphasia and right side hemiplasia, and you can see, see, uh, see the MCA uh, multiple scattered infarcts on diffusion vitreal images and open up the artery. So, this is the way we are treating. So, the standard care of treatment right now in acute stroke 4.5 hour. IV thrombolysis, you can use DP or telectoplase and if the large vessel or medium vessel occlusion is there, then thrombectomy. So this is about the acute stroke treatment. Now coming to the TIA, okay. So any neurological deficit which recover within a few hour, in an hour and this is because of some vascular insult is called the TIA and the most of the TIA actually recover within minutes. And almost all in a one hour. So the definition of TA has been changed. Initially when we used to study it was 24 hours. Now it's a only one hour. And there should not be any damage on MRI. If there is a damage in MRI, it's not a TA, it's a minor stroke. And those who are having the TIA, they have very high chances of recurrence in the first 40 hours. So it should be treated uh, urgently. It should be investigated urgently because if you are treating the etiology, you can say, prevent the second stroke. That may be lethal. Okay. So whenever you are asking, when you are investigating your uh, stroke patient, stroke suspect patient, always ask for the MR vessels also, uh, brain vessels also. So always with the MRI and MRI brain and neck vessels. So you are able to know the patient is having the atherosclerotic artery disease or not. So this is the study published in 2008. You can see that those who are having atherosclerotic artery disease in the brain or neck vessels, they have more chances of frequency. Okay. And uh, to treat uh, carotid sten uh, stenosis, we have the carotid endarctomy or uh, stenting. And with the expert hands now are very good gadgets which are available right now. Uh, we can place easily stent and when we are doing the stenting or plastic, we usually place a filter above the lesion. So when we are doing the stenting, uh, debris may come in the may go in the brain, which can be prevented by using the filter. 
and uh, uh, what is the guideline? So guideline says any symptomatic artery if it is more than 50% should be uh, uh, advised for the stenting or CEA. If asymptomatic artery on investigation then 80% should be, uh, the stenosis should be should more than 80%. It's a alternative but these are the clear indication where CE is not advocable. Like a high surgical respects patient that need a CABC, severe pulmonary artery disease, unstable angina, MI, bilateral disease, patient already had undergone a uh, 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 CA and then a restenosis. So these are the cases where you directly advised stenting than the CEA. Most of the uh, patients, they have a recurrence within two weeks, but within 48 hours, the chances is much more. So you have to do the stenting within a 48 hours if it is not a contraindication. The complication case is less than 2%. It's very uh, simple. So these are the different reasons where we did the uh, uh, stenting. Very severe stenosis, ulcerated plaque, long se segmental cell plaque. Even we can place a stent if uh, there is a dissection like in this case, uh, the artery is opened up. Blocked artery, complete 100% block, we are not opening most of the time. Only if the patient is symptomatic after the first episode or patient presented with the acute window period. Then we open complete blocked artery, carotid. Now coming to the intracranial, which is common in Asians compared to the western world. Here the periposterior complication rate will be a little higher. So with the first episode, stenting is not advised, advisable. But after the second or second episode, where patient is already on the multiple drugs, then stenting is advised. And uh, in the carotid where we are doing within a 40 hours, here we have to wait for three weeks before doing the stenting in intracranial stenosis. So these are the different location of stent uh, 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 in arteries like it is a MCA, this is a supraclinal ICA, this is a basilar artery, this is a vertebral osteo. Uh, 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 treated with a stent and uh, they didn't have any uh, DIO stroke afterward. So this is about the ischemic stroke. Now coming to the aneurysm, you all know about the aneurysm. Once it is ruptured, 25% of the patients, they are not reached to the, reaching to the hospital, they die. Even they reach to the hospital, 25% more patients, they die even with the, whatever the treatment you do. And the next 25%, they, even they recover, they have some morbidity. So it's a really a, a, a dangerous disease, have a bad prognosis if it is rupture. The most of the annual uh, which rupture, they have the size between the 2 millimeter to 6 millimeter. And uh, around 5% of the patients who have uh, severe headache presenting the emergency, they are having the SAH. So, uh, when to do? So, anybody uh, in the posterior circulation having the aneurysm should be treated, even if it is not ruptured. Anterior circulation more than 7 mm should be coiled, even if it is not ruptured. If it is less than 7 mm, then if anybody is having the polycystic kidney disease, having the daughter sick on aneurysm, Having previous history, having the family history of SAS should be treated even the size of aneurysm is less than 7 mm. So it's very simple to treat now these days. We just place a microcatheter in, into the aneurysm, fill up with the coil and thing is done. Now blood will not go inside the aneurysm, it's not going to re rupture. And sometimes we use the help of stent also if the mouth of aneurysm is large. In that situation, coil must make up to the parent artery and artery can be blocked because of the coils. So we have to use the stent. So these are the different location of aneurysm. All the aneurysm is now treatable with endovascular treatment, whatever the location. And this is the uh, uh, example of uh, uh, stent assisted coil. You can see the mouth of aneurysm is big. So we have to prevent the artery where the aneurysm is arising. And once, like in this case, we place the stent from here to here and then fill up the coil. Now we have the flow diverter for the bigger aneurysm, for larger aneurysm. So that place across the aneurysm neck, okay, after the placement actually changes the hemodynamic in the aneurysm. So after the placement, the blood will not go with the same force to the aneurysm and over the period, the aneurysm is going to shrunk up. Like in this case, you can see the big aneurysm after the placement of stent, uh, in the next six months, totally 
uh, disappear. So uh, 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 this kind of the flow diverter is now available and we are doing for the last 6-7 years with a, uh, a very good result and even uh, the, most of the surgeons were not able to reach on those uh, arteries. We have the interesting device also. Now AVM, the, this slide is very very important. When to suspect any vascular malformation? Uh, these are four locations where the hypertensive bead is happen. One is the vessel ganglia, one is the thalamus, one is the pons, one is the cerebellum. If bleed is be other than these four points, both four sides, should suspect something else. So ask for the CT angio or DSA to see the underlying aneurysm, AV malformation, dural fissure lock, or venous sinus thrombosis. So uh, we are doing the coil, uh, AVM embolization, these are the different AVM cases, dural fissure where the scale part is having direct connection with the intracranial sinuses and it increases the venous pressure and that can be embolized. About the CVT, most of the CVT respond very well with the heparin or anticoagulation at, except 5% of the patient where they have the severe uh, presentation or they are not responding with the uh, anticoagulation, then intervention is needed like this case. Uh, thank you so much. So I, in the next 12 minutes, we just I overview about the endovascular treatment which we are doing in the neuroscience field. Uh, so it's a sub specialty branch where we are dealing with the neurovascular disease of the brain. In uh, acute stroke for the large vessel occlusion or middle vessel occlusion, MD, mechanical thrombectomy is a standard of care now, okay? And the second, uh, the aneurysm, in the most of the world, nobody is doing the clipping now. So everybody, where the money is not a matter, significant, the coiling is the treatment. Third, the AV malformation or any malformation related to the uh, brain, which we can deal with the endovascular treatment. And uh, uh, sometimes, we embolize the tumor also, so surgeon can better operate the patient with the less amount of the blood loss. And the last, most of the CVT uh, patients, they respond very well with the anticoagulation, particularly heparin. Only 5% of the patients, they need aggressive approach and one of them is an endovascular treatment. So you all know the stroke is uh, two types, ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic is around 85% and hemorrhagic around 85%, uh, 15%. Uh, most common hemorrhage in the brain is happened because of the high blood pressure, but around 30%, this is may happen because of the aneurysm, which may rupture, maybe because of avium, maybe because of dural fissure, which can be taken uh, care by the endovascular approach. And the last is a TIA, transient ischemic attack. The most common cause of transient ischemic attack is the uh, atherosclerotic artery disease of large arteries of neck and brain. And these TIA have the high chances of recurrence because here is treatment is not just antiplatelet. You have to do something else, either CE or uh, stenting. Now coming to the ischemic stroke part, acute stroke treatment is to open up the artery within a time. Early, better is the outcome. Now we have the two treatment. One is a thrombolysis, which can be given up to 4.5 hours and thrombectomy up to 24 hours. So window is extended for thrombectomy up to 24 hours and uh, it's a sick, uh, good results. So we have the pathway for the stroke patient reaching to the emergency. If patient reaching in the 4.5 hours, IV thrombolysis. On NGO, if, it's a, if it is a large vessel occlusion or middle vessel occlusion, send the patient to the cath lab to open up the artery. If patient coming within 24 hours and after 2.5 hours, uh, 4.5 hours, then for the large vessel occlusion or MBO, directly cath lab. If patient comes beyond 24 hours, then we treat the complication which is likely to happen in the next 4-5 days. We want uh, to treat the patient should not have the recurrence of the stroke. So this is the way we are treating the stroke right now. What is the meaning of the large vessel occlusion or medium vessel occlusion? So uh, uh, yeah, internal carotid artery, MCA, MCA bifurcation, basilar artery 
or vertebral basilar system. These are the large vessel or medium sized vessel occlusion where uh, empty mechanical thrombectomy is advocated. So this is the case, uh, see presented with the uh, uh, right MCA stroke. So you can see the dense MCA sign, this is the earliest sign and uh, anybody can pick up. Otherwise CT is perfectly normal and uh, so we shift the patient to the directly cath lab. Uh, there was a contraindication for the IV thrombolysis, you can see this in half an hour. And uh, this MC was totally blocked and we placed a stent over here and uh, removed the clot, this is the clot and the artery is opened up in a one pass and you can see there is nothing turned upon that subsequent CT scan and patient improved on the birth. Another patient with a left MC stroke, global aphasia and right side hemiplasia and you can see, see, uh, see the MC uh, multiple scattered infarcts on diffusion vitreal images and open up the artery. So this is the way we are treating. So the standard care of treatment right now in acute stroke, 4.5 hour IV thrombolysis, you can use DP or telectoplase and if the large vessel or medial vessel occlusion is there, then thrombectomy. So this is about the acute stroke treatment. Now coming to the TIA, okay. So any neurological deficit which recover within a few hours in hour, and this is because of some vascular insult is called the TIA. And the most of the TIA actually recover within minutes. And almost all within a one hour. So the definition of TIA has been changed. Initially when we used to study it was 24 hours. Now it's a only one hour. And there should not be any damage on MRI. If there is a damage in MRI, it's not a TIA, it's a minor stroke. And those who are having the TIA, they have very high chances of recreation in the first 40 hours. So it should be treated uh, urgently, it should be investigated urgently because if you are treating the etiology, you can prevent the second stroke. That may be lethal. Okay. So whenever you are asking, when you are investigating your uh, stroke patient, stroke suspect patient, always ask for the MR vessels also, uh, brain vessels also. So always with the MRI and MRI brain and neck vessels, so you are able to know the patient is having the atherosclerotic artery disease or not. So this is the study published in 2008. You can see that those who are having atherosclerotic artery disease in the brain or neck vessels, they have more chances of frequency. Okay. And uh, to treat uh, keratid sten uh, stenosis, we have the keratid endarctomy or uh, stenting. And with the expert hands now are very good gadgets which are available right now. Uh, we can place easily stent and when we are doing the stenting or plastic, we usually place a filter above the lesion. So when we are doing the stenting, uh, debris may come in the may go in the brain, which can be prevented by using the filter. And uh, uh, what is the guideline? So guideline says any symptomatic artery if it is more than 50% should be uh, uh, advised for the stenting or CEA. If asymptomatic artery on investigation, then 80% should be, uh, the stenosis should be should more than 80%. It's an alternative, but these are the clear indications where CE is not advocable. Like a high surgical respects uh, patient that need a CABC, severe pulmonary artery disease, unstable angina, MI, bilateral disease, patient already had undergone a uh, 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 CA and then the stenosis. So these are the cases where you directly advised stenting than the CEA. Most of the uh, patients they have a recurrence within two weeks, but within 48 40 hours the chances is much more. So you have to do the stenting within a 40 hours if it is not a contraindication. The complication case is less than two percent. It's very uh, simple. So these are the different reasons where we did the uh, uh, stenting, very severe stenosis, ulcerated plaque, long se segmental cell plaque, even we can place a stent if uh, there is a dissection like in this case uh, the artery is opened up. Blocked artery, complete 100% block, we are not opening most of the time, only if the patient is symptomatic after the first episode or patient presented with the acute window period, then we open complete blocked artery keratid. Now coming to the intracranial, which is common in Asians compared to the western world. Here the periposterior complication rate will be little higher. So with the first episode, stenting is not advised, advisable. But after the 
second or second episode where patient is already on the multiple drugs, then stenting is advised. And uh, in the carotid where we are doing within a 40 hours, here we have to wait for three weeks before doing the stenting in intracranial stenosis. So these are the different location of stent uh, 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 in arteries like it is a MCA, this is a supraclinal ICA, this is a basilar artery, this is a vertebral osteo. Uh, 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 treated with a stent and uh, they didn't have any uh, GIO stroke afterward. So this is about the ischemic stroke. Now coming to the aneurysm, you all know about the aneurysm. Once it is ruptured, 25% of the patients, they are not raised to the, reaching to the hospital, they die. Even they raised to the hospital, 25% more patients, they die even with the, whatever the treatment you do. And the next 25%, they, even they recover, they have some morbidity. So it's a really uh, uh, a dangerous disease, have a bad prognosis if it is ruptured. The most of the annual uh, which rupture, they have the size between the 2 mm to 6 mm. And uh, around 5% of the patients who have uh, severe headache presenting to emergency, they are having the SOH. So uh, when to do? So anybody uh, in the posterior circulation having the aneurysm should be treated even if it is not ruptured. Anterior circulation more than 7 mm should be coherent even if it is not ruptured. If it is less than 7 mm, then if anybody is having the polycystic kidney disease, having the daughter sick on aneurysm, having previous history, having the family history of SAS should be treated even the size of aneurysm is less than 7 mm. So it's a very simple to treat now these days. We just place a micro catheter in, into the aneurysm, fill up with the coil, and thing is done. Now blood will not go inside the aneurysm, it's not going to be rupture. And sometimes we use the help of stent also if the mouth of aneurysm is large. In that situation, coil must make up to the parent artery and artery can be blocked because of the coils. So we have to use the stent. So these are the different location of aneurysm. All the aneurysm is now treatable with endovascular treatment, whatever the location. And this is the uh, uh, example of uh, uh, stent assisted coil. You can see the mouth of aneurysm is big. So we have to prevent the artery where the aneurysm is rising. And once, like in this case, we place the stent from here to here and then fill up the coil. Now we have the flow diverter for the bigger aneurysm, for larger aneurysm. So that place across the aneurysm neck, okay, after the placement actually changes the hemodynamic in the aneurysm. So after the placement the blood will not go with the same force of the aneurysm and over the period the aneurysm is going to shrunk up. Like in this case you can see the big aneurysm after the placement of stent uh, in the next six months totally uh, disappear. So uh, uh, the, this kind of the flow diverter is now available and we are doing for last six seven years with a, uh, a very good result. And even uh, the, most of the surgeons were not able to reach on those uh, arteries. We have the intrastate device also. Now AVM, the, this slide is very very important. When to suspect any vascular malformation? Uh, these are four locations where the hypertensive bleed is happen. One is the vessel ganglia, one is the thalamus, one is the pons, one is the cerebellum. If bleed is be, other than these four points, both four sides, should suspect something else. So ask for the CT NGO or DSA to see the underlying aneurysm, AV malformation, dural fissure or venous sinus thrombosis. So uh, we are doing the coil, uh, AVM embolization, these are the different AVM cases, dural fissure where the scale part is having direct connection with the intracranial sinuses and it increases the venous pressure and that can be embolized about the CVT. Most of the CVT respond very well with the heparin or anticoagulation at except 5% of the patient where they have the severe uh, presentation or they are not responding with the uh, anticoagulation then intervention is needed like this case. Uh, thank you so much. That is a phenylon, a newer uh, selective uh, non-steroidal uh, molecule that is a mineralocortical receptor antagonist for cardiorenal dysfunction. So what is its current status in India? So phenylon has been approved by DCGI and it is available commercially in India since 
August 2022 for with the indication of those who are having type 2 diabetes with associated chronic kidney disease. So diabetic kidney disease is the indication of starting this medication for prevention of further progression of the underlying kidney disease as well as development of cardiovascular complication in this high risk group. So why we are talking about diabetes and chronic kidney disease can be easily understood by this excellent study which was published in Kidney International that suggests that if the same diabetic patient develops associated chronic kidney disease that is the last uh, bar then chances of cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular mortality increases by twofold so from 15.7 to 32.3 and uh, development of estrogenal disease would be almost six times higher so what is current situation this is the burden of disease in india currently we are having more than 77 million of adult population with diabetes and out of them almost 48 percent are having associated chronic kidney disease but most worrisome thing is despite of good glycemic and blood pressure control that we know and we are doing it to our patients more than 30 percent of this type 2 diabetic patients they progress to chronic kidney disease so are we missing any therapy in this type 2 diabetic patients you we'll see so currently chronic kidney disease is not just classified by GFR or creatinine, we should uh, calculate uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio and as can be seen, whenever there is a rise in proteinuria, there will be fall in GFR. So proteinuria is a risk factor for progression of the chronic kidney disease. As well, as can be seen, not only just chronic kidney disease progresses, but associated cardiovascular risk increases whatsoever amount of GFR patient is having even if GFR is good if patient develops proteinuria then development of cardiovascular event would be higher so that's why uh, screening of both estimated GFR as well as proteinuria is recommended by each and every guidelines so currently we are treating our patients with type 2 diabetes with good glycemic as well as metabol uh, uh, hemodynamic control but we are missing third uh, driver of this progression of chronic kidney disease in type 2 diabetes that is inflammation and fibrosis. That can be seen by this uh, major studies whatsoever amount of hemodynamic or metabolic control you achieve there will be always this gray area of residual risk of progression of this patients to uh, ancestral disease or cardiovascular event. So this residual risk is because of this inflammation and fibrosis. So if we target this inflammation and fibrosis by certain medication, then we can prevent or reduce this residual risk. So studies have shown that instead of chronic kidney disease or congestive cardiac failure, there are uh, there is increased activation by multiple mechanism of mineral corticoid receptors, and by down regulatory mechanism, they increase generation of pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic cytokines and that will lead to progression of chronic kidney disease and uh, cardiac remodeling. So phenylalanine is a novel non-steroidal selective mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. What we mean by selective, it is having more selective action towards mineral rather than glucocorticoid. It binds with the uh, mineralocorticoid receptor, causes conformational changes in these receptors and that will last for 24 hours. So its effect is there for 24 hours and that is why its dose is OD. It is rapidly metabolized subsequently by liver and excreted. So there is no active metabolism subsequently left. So by uh, inhibiting this receptor activity, there will be downgrade of downgradation of inflammation and fibrosis. So as can be seen, this is the third generation mineral cortical receptor antagonist and this is the only available mineral or recommended molecule for CKD with type 2 diabetic patients for prevention of further progression. If we wish to compare, then it is equivalently potent to uh, uh, say spironolactone, but it is more selective, it is having shorter half-life and no uh, subsequent metabolites left. So even if there is any side effect, we can just discontinue for a while and then restart the molecule. It does not have major uh, corticoid side effects, so there is no gynecomastia observed and at, it does not cause uh, across its blood brain barrier, there is least effect on blood pressure. So what are the evidences that uh, this phenylalanine is effective in type 2 diabetic CKD patient? 
So there are two major phase three clinical trials, Fidelio and Figaro. We are not going to go in depth of that on these trials, but we are going to study its uh, uh, pooled analysis called uh, fidelity. That is the evidence of 13,000 patients. That is, a, I suppose, the highest possible evidence for any molecule in type two diabetic CKD patients. So uh, here, uh, study was done for uh, effect of phenylalanine in type two diabetic CKD patients for their cardiovascular as well as kidney composite outcome and this was the uh, patient char uh, characters uh, most of the patients were uh, having GFR more than 30 and uh, uh, more than 25 and uh, uh, gross amount of or moderate to gross amount of proteinuria they were having long standing but well controlled diabetes and they were otherwise hemodynamically well controlled with all of them having um, uh, ACE or ARBs on board so it showed there is a uh, 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 improvement of cardiovascular outcome in uh, this group of patients by almost 14 percentage and uh, most striking finding is uh, there is a 29 percentage reduction in hospitalization because of heart failure. Similarly improvement in uh, composite renal outcome was there by 23 percentage and most striking finding is development of end stage renal disease reduced by 36 percentage. So if you start this molecule in your diabetic CKD patients with proteinuria, it reduces chances of end stage renal disease by 36 percentage, that is a gross. And striking finding is its effect on proteinuria was independent to SGLT2 inhibitors and at the, as can be seen only 7 percentage of population at the start of this trial was on uh, SGLT2 inhibitor and reduction of proteinuria was up to 32 percentage. That is observed after four months of therapy and uh, is continued. So this is efficacy. What about its uh, safety? So overall safety uh, of any adverse event or serious adverse event were equivalent in both group of placebo as well as study molecule. There was least effect on HPA1C. Uh, blood pressure was modestly affected up to three to four millimeter of mercury, and there were no glucocorticoid related side effect like gynecomastia. Most common side effect observed was hyperkalemia, but significant hyperkalemia leading to treatment discontinuation was very less and zero death observed in this 13,000 patient across three years. So whom should be initiated? So ADA recommends that uh, all patients with type 2 diabetic CKD should be uh, first uh, have proper lifestyle modification then followed by first line medication is glycemic control, blood pressure control and lipid management and then organ specific uh, management for uh, benefit of kidney as well as heart and here comes the role of fenylalanine. So again KDGO 2022 uh, gives us holistic approach for type 2 diabetic CKD patient. All patients should undergo lifestyle modification and then um, uh, starting them on proper glycemic as well as uh, um, hemodynamic control including RAS inhibition. In, after that, if patient develops proteinuria, then there is a role of phenylalanine. So KDGO uh, uh, gives us guideline that uh, position of phenylalanine is after treatment of RAS inhibition to further uh, uh, to prevent further deterioration of chronic kidney disease or development of cardiovascular event in this group. So each and every guidelines gives uh, phenylalanine a grade A recommendation for uh, prevention of uh, CKD progression and cardiovascular event. So let us go by two cases. This is a 59 years old gentleman who is uh, suffering from type 2 diabetes for almost 8 years and uh, otherwise well controlled uh, sugar as well as blood pressure under effect of uh, uh, AC inhibitors. Uh, he is in follow up showing gradual deterioration of proteinuria and renal function. So what should we uh, do now? We have treated him adequately with hemodynamic as well as metabolic control. So what must be the cause of further deterioration? As we have seen, it must be inflammation and fibrosis. And if we do not give him fibrinone, then there are chances of progression of chronic kidney disease, development of end stage disease, end stage renal disease and cardiovascular event. So we started this patient on fibrinone. So which dose we should start it? start this patient. So phenylalanine is available in uh, two format 10 mg and 20 mg tablet. So whenever you are starting this patient on phenylalanine, uh, you should first check potassium and estimated GFR. If potassium is less than four, uh, say less than five, you can start this medication and then see GFR. If GFR is more than 60, you start with 20 mg. 
but if it is less than 60 and more than 25 you start with 10 and if it is less than uh, 25 you do not start so here his GFR is more than 65 and uh, pot uh, potassium is 4.3 so we started him on 20 milligram and in follow up after one month we redo his potassium which was again normal less than 5 so we continue with the dose of 20 milligram so coming to another case more severe uh, CKD more proteinuria is uh, falling in uh, stage uh, 3 uh, of uh, CKD showing gradual progression of proteinuria again he was uh, started on uh, phenrenone but as his GFR was 42 we started him on uh, 10 milligram of uh, tablet in follow up his uh, potassium was still in acceptable range so we increased the dose to 20 milligram but if there is a hyperkalemia we have to stop so what are contraindications if patient's GFR is less than 25 you do not start if patient is already on uh, phenrenone and GFR falls below 15 you stop if there is hepatic dysfunction uh, then you do not start additions crisis naturally we do not start and if patient is on say CYP 3A4 inductors or inhibitors you do not start so with that I am uh, coming to some question and answer session so you can have your answer pads so what is approved indication of using phenrenone any proteinuric illness with chronic kidney disease diabetic proteinuric illness with chronic kidney disease cardiorenal syndrome in ICU patient or all of the above sorry <laughs> it is not all of the above it is diabetic proteinuric illness this is the only recommendation as of now Yes, studies are going on for other uh, parameters, but it is as of now recommended in diabetic kidney disease patients. Uh, another question on treatment if patient develops hyperkalemia, will I discontinue phenylalanine first? I will discontinue AC inhibitors or ARPs first. I will continue both and add anticalemic therapy first, or I will discontinue both. Hyperkalemia. Six percent is saying that um, phenylalanine should be discontinued, and B is uh, will discontinue both. Answer is D. You have to discontinue both. Then after some time, you restart with AC inhibitor or ARBs, and after that, you start with lower dosage of um, phenylalanine once potassium is less than five. Can I start phenylalanine without AC inhibitor or ARBs? Yes or no? No, you cannot start. So you have to adequately uh, control your uh, um, say patient should be under appropriate treatment of ACE and ARBs and uh, phenylalanine comes down the line. So ACE and ARBs are first line of therapy and then subsequently phenylalanine. So can I start phenylalanine without SGLD2 inhibitor? Yes or no? absolutely right you can start so it is not absolutely necessary to have uh, a specific medication for glycemic control you can control your sugar by any method and then if patient is adequately controlled with sugar and blood pressure if there is still persistent deterioration of GFR or proteinuria you can add you know. so I suppose thank you very much today I am going to share something about my five years data and what I have learned over a period of time in last five years with treating this heart transplantation patients. So starting with the global data, if you look at the global data, the number of heart transplantations have increased significantly from 2009 wherein almost around five to six thousand heart transplantations were performed all over uh, the world has now reached to almost 8,000 transplantation across the world and the percentage wise if you look at it is almost 1.9 percent uh, per population per million population the heart transplantation is being performed across the world 
and if you look at the uh, demographically majority i would say 50 to 60 percent of the transplantations are being performed in united states of america followed by european countries and then there are few countries across the southeast asia and china india is slowly picking up and becoming a strong leader in heart transplantation and this is all because of the increase in the organ donation awareness and if you look at this chart which correlates with the organ donation rates in india with the increase in organ donation rate the number of heart transplantation and lung transplantations have increased and that has seen a good rise in the number of transplantations and similar has happened at our center also in Ahmedabad also if you look at 2015 and before that there was no heart donation in the state of Gujarat in 2015 the first heart donation occurred in 2016 we started the heart transplantation program and that year we had seven heart donations from the state of Gujarat. It is in 2020 and 2021 when the civil hospital Ahmedabad really started the organ donation program and initiated the organ donation awareness and everything and that is where we really saw a huge jump in number of heart donation across the state of Gujarat. So you can see in 2020 the number of heart donations were just 7 whereas in 21, 18 and in 22 almost 31 so double the number of uh, heart donations that are being uh, occurring in the state of Gujarat. And if you look at the number of heart transplantation Yes, in Sims Hospital initial the pace was low because of multiple uh, reasons and one of the major reasons is the organ donation rate, awareness in the physicians and the cardiology society and acceptance by the general population. But last in 2021 we did 14 transplantations, last year we did 12 transplantations. So all in with yesterday's transplantations we have completed 38 heart transplantations at Sims. If you look at the pathology point of view, if you look at what are the causes uh, or indications that we have operated in heart transplantation, the majority of the cases are dilated cardiomyopathy, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, it may be even postpartum dilated cardiomyopathy also and the second is the ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy and if you compare it with the ISHLD data or international data, more or less the pie, pie chart is more or less the same. From gender perspective, 73% of the patients were male patients and 27% patients are female patients. And if you look at the age distribution that we have, less than 20 years, we have 4 patients. Less Between 20 to 40, we have maximum that is the 17 patients. And above 40 and below 60, we have 16 patients who have undergone transplantations. If you look at the length of stay, in majority of the patients, if you look at majority of the patients have been discharged in less than 15 days, except few, you can see the taller buildings in between the normal small houses. So that are the reason that we are going to discuss why prolonged stay in few of the patients. Complications post heart transplantation. So uh, we had three patients who had severe rejections of which we have lost two patients and one patient survived with the treatment and patient is doing fine and again the ejection fraction is back to 55% uh, after the treatment. We had mild rejections in 12% of uh, 12 patients, majority of the patients treated with the medical management and they are doing fine. Because of the COVID era, we had 15 patients who had 8, uh, eight, eight patients who had COVID infections and but good thing is, in spite of the COVID infection, we had no mortality because of COVID in any of our transplantation patients. Infection after discharge, 15 patients. Aspergillosis in 3 patients, this is one of the dreaded complications of immunosuppression. And, and if the patient is living in an area where there is a construction, where there is, I would say, uh, some cattle and around that, that is where the aspergillus infections can occur and one patient had parvovirus infection. This is the least a list of investigations. All once or twice the patients they had some form of infection but not any deadly infection which has caused any mortality in these patients. Now very, coming to the very important point is the mortality data. 
the upper chart upper diagram uh, bar diagram is international standard second bar diagram is the orange color is the percentage of sims uh, results and the third blue bar diagram is actual number so the 30 day mortality that we have is 5.4 percent that is two patients have died within 30 days of transplantation and the international data shows that it is 10 percent and one year mortality that we have is we had uh, three patients who have died at the end of three years and overall 10% uh, is the uh, mortality at one year as compared to the international data that is 15.5% is the international uh, benchmark. So what are the lessons that we have learned from all these cases? So first heart transplantation in 2016 and let me tell you that first heart transplantation taught us n number of lessons. First very important thing is you have to be committed, persistent and dedicated to your patient and if you are dedicated then the patients they come out because this patient and this patient had a very bad illness pre-operatively we had given almost 150 shocks on IVP ventilator for almost 20 days and that patient ultimately relatives they agreed upon for the surgery but important thing is post-operatively patient had CMV pneumonia patient had uh, bacterial infections patient was in ICU for almost 75 days obviously the first patient we were very cautious to so be kept in ICU for 75 days but yes 75 days in the ICU with lot of complications dialysis CRRT everything was there and this patient came out and taught us that commit if you do the work with commitment and dedication with the science in your hand then definitely you can get this patients out and this is when I went to his home after two years in Jamnagar patient with his family. Uh, this is a very uh, important case uh, of preoperative optimization. Of. So uh, this is a case, a second heart transplantation patient. Patient, uh, the donor was in Surat. This is the echo of the donor. The EF and everything is absolutely normal. But patient was not prepared. The donor was not prepared. Patient was on high anotropic support. Patient was given adrenaline purges to get the patient into the OR for organ retrieval. So we took that heart because our patient also recipient was very critically ill. So we had no other option but took the heart. But important thing is the donor was not optimized. This is the echo after coming off unclamping the heart. And you can see that heart is absolutely not moving there is hardly any movement in the left ventricle. So it is a nightmare for us, but yes, we know we can treat this because we knew the cause, uh, what is the reason behind this, there was no rejection. So what we did is we did uh, uh, ECMO and on second day of ECMO, the heart started moving and the ejection fraction was improving slowly. And with the help of ECMO on sixth post operative day, ejection fraction was back to normal. So this is how you can treat the patient with the help of multi-modality treatment apart from ECMO, medical therapy, uh, optimization of the myocardium, all this is required. So pre-operative optimization, if the pre-operative optimization of donor is not there, then definitely we face a lot of issues. Risk factor for transplantation, yes, raised serum creatinine level, serum bilirubin level, raised RA pressures and ascites. Any recipient or any patient having all these four factors stands a very high risk chance for transplantation. So it is very important, heart is weak and rest of the organs are weak. In between there is a golden period, you have to catch hold of patient in that period and you get the better outcomes. If you look at the ACCHA guidelines, the important indicator, very objective indicator is VO2 max less than 12 millimeter per kg per minute is an indication for transplantation and if the patients are done at the right time with a good indication the stay is less patients can be discharged even on ninth day and tenth day and if the patients with the tall buildings they all had renal dysfunction they had liver dysfunction and that is the reason why the stay was extended in the hospital this is the uh, patient we did in uh, covid and this is a very important, a very nice case. 
a patient this is a 17 year old female patient had viral myocarditis uh, covid viral myocarditis in july 21 till july 21 to almost november we tried to med uh, manage medically but unfortunately she did not recover was on mildenone therapy for continuous so many days so ultimately we decided to list her for transplantation and the mri that we got was this inflammations and Uh, fibrosis, complete inflammation and fibrosis. So there was no chance of the recovery. And this is the myocardium, the cut section of the heart. You can see lot of fibrosis in the myocardium and in the histopath also. Myocardium was totally damaged. We did the transplantation. Patient improved and patient has completed now one year uh, post heart transplantation. I won't go into this because the uh, paucity of time. Perioperative optimization of the recipient mildenone therapy. I would say Indian Elved. In India, patient having severe pH or high pH pressures, we cannot afford to have Elveds in these patients and then plan for transplantation. But in this case scenario, if you keep these patients on mildenone therapy, their pH pressures they come down gradually over a period of one month or two months, and then these patients they do well and then they can be transpla uh, uh, transplanted. Uh, for transplantations so just take home message heart transplantation is the ultimate form of uh, therapy for end stage heart failure early reference is the key for better resource optimization donor optimization is must for better outcomes ra pressures raise serum creatinine and sit is a strong predictor of morbidity and mortality post heart transplantation injection mildenone is the cheaper indian alvet a uh, medical elevator i would say and financial should not be an obstacle for heart transplantation thank you very much and i appreciate i am going to talk about cpi and acls <laughs> what's the update i'm sure every one of us have done cpr for our patients or our relatives and uh, a situation before years and now has changed a bit with some new additions in the guidelines and in between covid came and then there is a vast majority of people who are knowing what is cpr to media and social media and everything so let's go ahead what cpr and why we are updating it right now in this conference so one thing if you have done any cpr or bls courses you would notice that there is one more addition to this chain of survival our usual chain of survival was early recognition and prevention activation of emergency response system high quality cpr defibrillation and post cardiac arrest care post cardiac arrest care was added in 2016 and now they have added recovery also so to complete the cycle of potential patient not having any neurological deficit also has been added in the cpr or the acls guidelines so i am sure every one of us know that it is not abc it is cab right now the compression is important a and b can come later but the basic steps are very clear you have to verify that scene is safe then activate the emergency response system once you see an unconscious patient or a gasping patient and when you have activated the emergency response system at the same time you have observed that breathing is abnormal or normal and patient is not responding the next step is immediately the c that is compression and the rate is 30 to 2 and if you have a second rescue or the second person helping you then you can continue with someone doing airway part and someone doing compression part but make sure that aed comes into picture as fast as possible when you are asking for help you are asking for aed as well so someone please come with aed that is the call we are supposed to give because every single second delay in using defibrillatory shocks will add 10% mortality to your patient whom you are giving cpr okay when you are noticing that it is shockable rhythm you are giving shocks 
and when you are noticing it is non shockable rhythm that is pa or a systole you are not supposed to give shocks so pa means for a simple learning any rhythm on your monitor which is not vt or vf in a pulseless patient is considered pa so if you are seeing af and there is no pulse then don't call it af it is pa and it is non shockable rhythm so when you have started cpr the shockable rhythm it is vt without pulse and vf the cycle goes like this first shock then adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes second shock you are supposed to add something more that is amiodarone and that is a bolus dose again it is not our practice to give bolus doses of amiodarone and that to 2 amps that is 300 mg so it is 300 mg bolus to be given in d5 solution during your cpr cycle when you have given a second shock as your vf has not reverted after first shock and in third shock you are again repeating your adrenaline because already 3 to 5 minutes have passed every 2 minute you are checking the pulse and the rhythm and giving shock till it is converted to either non shockable rhythm or there is rosc that is spontaneous circulation with normal ecg and pulse so this continues in shockable rhythm till n number of times so it is not that 20 shocks have been given or two shocks have been given and we are failing you are supposed to continue till you have chances of survival of the patient i'll come to when to stop and when to discuss stopping the cpr if it is non shockable rhythm every 3 to 5 minute adrenaline that is the only drug to be given in non shockable rhythm adrenaline if not available you can replace it with vasopressin but there is no evidence where vasopressin helps or vasopressin replacement or vasopressin plus adrenaline helps so adrenaline is the first drug and the only drug if not available you can replace any dose with vasopressin a new addition was ecmo so ecpr you can induce ecmo support during cpr if your center is kind of a center of excellence and you have all the gadgets and the skills available around you when this event has occurred so ecmo has been added as a supportive therapy during cpr and that is ecpr but only skilled person or skilled centers can do this because unskilled area it can create a disturbance in your compression adult post cardiac arrest care algorithm it is very much involved since 2015 and 16 guidelines and which says that you are supposed to start with your abcds when your rosc has been achieved so that is airway control breathing support circulation go for 12 ladies if needed go for revascularization with ongoing neurological support if patient is unconscious you are supposed to do targeted temperature management and the targeted temperature management says that you are not allowing the patient to have any hyperthermia so 32 to 36 degrees the temperature we are supposed to manage at least for next 24 to 48 hours in a hope to give brain some rest to get a better neurological recovery after this resuscitation has been successful at least from cardiopulmonary side then you have to wait for neurological side for 24 to 48 hours again this has been repeatedly pushed by many guidelines and many societies also cardiological neurological societies that cardiac resuscitation is never complete if you have no neurological recovery so another term also has been used by many clinicians cpcr cardiopulmonary and cerebral resuscitation there is a checklist available also you can keep this in your icus or er or your hospitals where they have to tick that post cardiac arrest care has been formally initiated and followed or not which discusses about oxygenation ventilation hemodynamic monitoring temperature monitoring neuro monitoring sedation and prognosis has been discussed or not also 
so even patient counseling has been emphasized in new cpr guidelines so coming to advanced airway everyone rushes for intubation even if it is saying cav there is always a push that airway control is only done with intubation no it is not done if you are not skilled you are wasting time and in between breaks during your compression actually hampers the coronary reperfusion and it ultimately wastes your cpr efforts so unless you are skilled enough to do intubation in 10 seconds you can avoid it as long as there is a chest rise while doing any other maneuver may it be back mask ventilation may it be any other airway supports like lma or combi tube yes if there is a chest rise you can avoid your intubation during cpr for pregnant patient one emphasis has been repeatedly put that performing perimortem cesarean delivery should be an option offered to every pregnant patient who is undergoing CPR to have some kind of survival benefit. This CPR has another one point to remember any pregnant patient you have to displace the uterus towards left side while compressing the chest and second is this performing perimortem cesarean delivery. When to terminate your BLS, that is basic life support. You don't have drugs and you are just continuing the BLS. When to terminate? If arrest is not witnessed by EMS services, if there is no return of spontaneous circulation before transport and there was no shock delivered. Remember I said that AED is must to be used in any arrest situation. So if all criteria are present, you can consider termination and if any criteria is missing, you can continue your resuscitation. Same goes for ACLS, no bystander CPR, no return of circulation before transport or no shock delivered. You can terminate if all criteria are there. In summary, CPR still says that it is CAB. Every 2 minute pulse check, if shockable, give shock, use amiodarone along with your adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes and if it is non shockable, 3 to 5 minute adrenaline with continuous compression. CPR quality is must, no interruptions unless for pulse check or using airway adjuncts. Summary of major changes is adrenaline is equal to adrenaline plus or minus vasopressin or vasopressin alone. Amiodarone and lidocaine are equivalent. So keep it simple and use only one drug. Waveform capnography is must to see your quality of CPR. And atropine dose for bradycardia algorithm is now 1 mg. Many of us are still using 0.5 or 0.6 mg, but it is 1 mg. And dopamine infusion rate has been increased from 2 microgram to 20 to 5 to 20 microgram for chemical pacing in bradycardia or heart blocks. So clinicians should wait at least 72 hours after return to normothermia before performing multimodal neuroprognostication. So at least wait for 72 hours before declaring that patient may not survive or patient may not have good quality of life and is comatose. After resuscitation, debriefing of lay rescuers, EMS providers, hospital based health covers it is beneficial to support their mental health and well-being along with your patients relatives so counseling is must and debriefing can help cope up our mental stress in our icus er or hospitals thank you so it is very common problem especially in the elderly patients almost we have seen 80 percent of the elderly prescriptions are having one of these um, medicines for this problem right so let us understand this so firstly we will understand how the uh, neural innervation to the bladder and so uh, bladder occurs right so lower urinary tract consists of bladder and urethra it has mainly two roles to store the urine and to void whenever the appropriate time is eyes there so <coughs> You must have seen this neuronal uh, neural innervation figure, but it is very complicated. We will understand it very simply. So basically three types of innervation to the bladder, sympathetic, parasympathetic and somatic, which is under voluntary control, which is controlled by the supraspinal uh, level at the two level, fontaine and the cortex, right? So this is the innervation. 
So here we can see that sympathetic innervation comes from the T10 to L2 and which innervates the detrusor muscles and the internal urethral sphincter. It relaxes the muscle and contracts this uh, urethral sphincter so it promotes storage right and uh, this is the parasympathetic innervation which comes from the uh, sacral region which also innervates the both but it will contract the detrusor muscle and it will simultaneously relax this uh, uh, sphincter so this synergy is very important. And the voluntary, uh, the somatic control will also come from the som uh, sacral region and it will uh, uh, innervate the external urethral sphincter which is pelvic floor muscles. So, uh, this innervation is controlled by the uh, higher uh, level which is at the pontine level which is uh, a center, there is a center pontine micturation center. So, it is basically a relay uh, between this uh, cortical and the lower innervating circuits. So, it is a relay. So, a pontine micturation center is a micturation center. So, it is always trying to empty the bladder. So, it needs to be continuously inhibited right, by the higher center to promote storage. As our bladder is 99% of the time in the storage phase. So, whenever the uh, higher center decides to start voiding, the inhibition is removed from this center and the voiding start by the parasympathetic outflow. So this is the center which switches between voiding and storage phase, right? And which will be decided by this cortical level. So pronte micturition has no any decision authority. So it will be decided by the uh, cortical center and then if uh, removes the inhibition then it will promote the parasympathetic outflow from here and voiding will occur. Otherwise 99% of the time it is inhibited by the cortex. So, higher centers which are uh, there are um, the, uh, the peripheral gray matter of the midbrain, medial prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia, cerebellum and hypothalamus which has different roles will, but in general they interpret the uh, sensation of the bladder fullness and social appropriateness and it uh, com combinedly uh, remove the inhibition from the pontine micturition center. So, basically cortical control which is primarily inhibit, uh, inhibits the PMC all the time to store urine and whenever it receives the sensation of bladder fullness and social appropriateness it removes inhibition and uh, pontine micturition center main role is to maintain the detrusor sphincter synergy and it switches between the storage and voiding state by the uh, which is decided by the higher centers sympathetic is promoting storage parasympathetic outflow is promoting voiding Somatic innervation will be controlled by the uh, uh, higher centers and it is under voluntary control. So basically uh, the, uh, the bladder is in st uh, storage phase under the sympathetic uh, uh, out, uh, contraction and whenever uh, we, we feel that uh, uh, voiding is decided by the conscious decision, many of us might have the bladder fullness sensation but uh, we, there is no social appropriateness so it is our cent PMC center is inhibited by voluntary control. So uh, whenever we we go to uh, urinal, we'll, uh, the, uh, we'll remove the inhibition from the uh, PMC center and parasympathetic system will promote the voiding. So any problem at the level of brain, spinal cord and sacral cord will cause the neurogenic bladder. If it is uh, at the level of brain, it is cortical bladder. If it is at the level of pontine micturition center, up to the suprasacral region, it is a spastic bladder and spinal bladder as we can also say that and autonomous bladder if the problem is at the level of sacral region. So cortical bladder as we understood that main function of the higher centers are to inhibit. So the inhibition, uh, the removed and PMC released from the inhibitory uh, uh, cerebral control. So it detrusor will activate during the storage phase, storage, storage phase. So frequency, you will have uh, frequent uh, uh, sensations of the bladder fullness. And so you will, if the sensation occurs, you will not able to suppress it. So it is urgency and you cannot voluntarily hold the voiding. So urge incontinence. So uh, these, these are the three symptoms, frequency, urgency and urge incontinence. Mind it, there is no any hesitancy, there is, it is otherwise safe bladder because there is no um, residual urine, so infections are uncommon and uh, there is no unconscious incontinence. Uh, ma ma mainly uh, the treatment is by the anticholinergics, this, that, those are anti-muscularic, uh, parasympatholytic, so it will promote storage and uh, definitely causes a uh, Whenever the problem is in the brain, like stroke, brain tumor, Parkinson's disease, MSA, etc. So, this will cause these three symptoms and cortical bladder. So, autonomous bladder, whenever the problem is at the sacral region, 
the parasympathetic uh, outflow is impaired so definitely there is uh, poor contraction so paralytic it is also known as paralytic bladder so there is parasympathetic innervation is lost and uh, voiding is impaired this problem is in the voiding so uh, um, and also the sensation of fullness uh, bladder fullness will be taken from this same level so patient, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sensation of bladder fullness will be not there and simply the bladder emptying doesn't occur it, uh, until it stretches beyond its capacity so this is known as overflow incontinence so patient will be having no sensation only overflow incontinence will be there and uh, because of this uh, autonomous system it is known as autonomous bladder right uh, the causes is definitely at the, any lesions at the sacral level at the conus medialis or coda equina will cause this and initial shock phase of the spinal cord injury will also cause this type of bladder symptoms as we understood that retention of urine which is initially painless overflow incontinence and increased residual urine because contactability is impaired and the only treatment is catheterization otherwise no other treatment will help uh, when there is problem at the pontine maturation center up to the suprasacral region this spastic bladder will happen where the detrusal uh, synergy is lost and also the contactability will be affected so residual urine will be also there along with the painful uh, dysuria so uh, for uh, urine, urine dynamic study will show the detrusal hyperreflexia striated muscle uh, striated sphincter dyssynergia and smooth sphincter dyssynergia <coughs> motor paralytic bladder whenever there is or lesions involving the effort motor fibers to the detrusal muscles uh, or um, motor neuron in the sacral spinal cord. So, whenever the problem is in the lower sacral injury, that is lumbosacral meningomyosin and radical hysterectomy or abdominal peritoneal surgery will also damage sometimes pudental nerve, which is different to the, uh, the, um, uh, the bladder. So, there will be uh, uh, sensation will be uh, uh, preserved. So, there will be painful urinary tension and catheterization is the only solution sensory paralytic bladder might happen there is there is efferent uh, problem in the uh, uh, innervating the bladder system so basically it happens generally in the types dorsalis uh, syringomyelia or some sometimes long standing diabetes mellitus so uh, this patient will be having uh, voluntary initiation of menstruation so bladder retraining will help in these cases so basically three types of bladder suprapontine, infrapontine and suprasacral uh, problem and infrasacral lesion. So the uh, cortical bladder will be having no post void residue and the infrapontine will be having urgency, urge, uh, frequency and urgent continence along with the hesitancy and interrupted stream. They, they will have post void residue and infrasacral will be having only voiding problem and they will have post void residue significantly. So the, to diagnose this, we have invasive and non-invasive tests. So uh, uh, non-invasive tests are generally hydrofluorometry along with the uh, ultrasound measurement of post void residue. So whenever you are suspecting that there is a very uh, voiding problem, patient is saying that I need to strain, I need to have uh, hesitancy while initiating the urination, then go for the non-invasive test, it will diagnose it. And if the patient is having urgency, urge frequency and uh, urge incontinence, then definitely there is a storage problem, then you have to do an invasive testing uh, to uh, look for the real time, uh, real time uh, uh, synergy between the bladder and the abdominal pressure, pressure right. So it is uh, important to detect the detrusal over, over activity which is a storage dysfunction right. So these two tests will help the uh, diagnose the problem if we cannot judge it clinically. So complications from this might are like uh, uh, trabeculations and trabecular because of the hypertrophy, aggressive uh, uh, urethral reflex and hypernephrosis and these patients are prone to infections. So management definitely general measures like fluid intake, reduced caffeine intake, bladder retraining and pelvic floor muscle exercise will help in these patients but definitely we have to identify what is the problem. There is a storage dysfunction or the void investment because if you treat it improper then the problem will increase rather than treating it. So if the patient is having a post void residue is more than 100 then it is significant voiding dysfunction, main treatment is clean intermittent catheterization and otherwise sometimes if bladder outflow obstruction is then alpha blocker will help.
if it is storage dysfunction definitely we have to do uh, we have to give uh, anti muscarinic uh, medications like sorotin rolitin uh, oxybutynin etc we can give so it will promote the storage and uh, newer beta 3 agonist miragebron can also be used along with edit, edit, uh, along with the sorotin and rolitin so that, that will also promote the storage desmopressin it can be used once in a 24 hour whenever we are the main problem is in the nocturnal frequency so it can be used once in a um, 24 hour botulinum toxin can also be used it will uh, inactivate the bladder or uh, uh, in inhibit the overactive bladder but the problem is sometimes paralytic bladder might happen so basically if the patient is having urgency uh, 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 and frequency you just need to test for the urinary tract infections and Post post weight residue. If the post weight residue is less than 100, then you can safely give the anti-muscarinic agents. If the post weight residue is more than 100, then definitely you have to teach the clean intermittent self catheterization. So basically, we have to understand that what is the bladder dysfunction? Either storage problem is there or voiding problem. If the post weight residue is significant. Then catheterization is a treatment of choice, and if it is the storage dysfunction, you can safely give the anti-muscarinic agents. So this is the uh, question. If uh, you just take your voting pad in your hand, so this is the elderly male who has the problem in the uh, walking and recent memory impairment, and this is the MRI. So what is the what will be the symptoms of these patients? The problem is at the level of brain. You can see some uh, dilatation of the ventricle. So, what will be the symptoms? So, absolutely, you understood the problem well. So, there is a cortic problem at the brain level. So, there will be frequency urgency, urge incontinence. Otherwise, there will be no any uh, uh, sensation of incomplete evacuation. What, what will the treatment of sim these symptoms? The uh, repetition is the treatment of choice. This is a case of a normal pressure hydrocephalus. But definitely, uh, we the rolitin, dolterotin, anti muscarinic agents will help. So, if another question that patient is having uh, Parkinson's disease and patient is having problem of urinary frequency, dribbling of urine, uh, poor stream of the urine, and straining while urine. So, what will be the problem? What will your next approach. Uh, actually, if you give uh, the, this, the uh, patient is having thin stream of urine and straining while urine. So there is a better outflow obstruction, right? The patient is having Parkinson's disease, but the main problem is the hesitancy and the poor uh, stream of urine. So refer to the urologist, you can, uh, Urimax will help, but definitely solitan and rolling anti muscarinic will increase the problem. It will not uh, treat it, but rather it will increase the problem. Thank you so much. So I have been assigned the topic of management of UTI is the OPD perspective. So I will not be discussing any critical patients and complicated UTIs, that is the first. So how many of us treat UTIs in our outpatient practice? Excellent. So I have a good audience today. Yeah. So we know that UTIs are among the most prevalent infectious diseases in the general population, which pose substantial financial burdens, significant morbidity and mortality. Because of the increased rates of antimicrobial resistance, we are having lesser oral options in the antibiotics to treat these patients. And of course, we know that the treatment in females with recurrent infections, whether it is, you know, a recurrent simple cystitis or complicated infections and treatment in the elderly is really underwhelming. So if we talk about the definitions of UTI, the conventional historical definition says that a significant bacteriuria is considered a colony count of more than 10 raised to 5. However, if your patient is symptomatic, for symptoms of dysuria, you know, frequency or burning, then the colony count actually does not matter. Even a count of 10 raised to 2 or 10 raised to 3 has to be considered significant. If we classify UTI very, uh, you know, in very simple manner, then we have acute simple cystitis, where it is confined to the bladder and there are no signs or symptoms that suggest an upper urinary tract involvement or systemic infection. Then we have acute, uh, acute complicated UTI 
where your patient would present with fever, chills, rigors, significant malaise, flying pain, costo vertebral angle tenderness, or perineal pain in men. Now, there are some special populations like pregnant females and renal transplant recipients where we cannot, you know, just classify them into simple acute cystitis or complicated UTI because this is the group where we have to, you know, deal very, very cautiously. So, today we will be discussing mainly this that is our outpatients. So, whenever a patient comes to you with symptoms suggestive of UTI or a culture report where urine, you know, urine culture is positive, first you have to ask yourself whether it is a truly a UTI. Then the next question which comes to our mind is what should be the empirical therapy? Whether I should send the urine cultures or not? Then how do I de-escalate or escalate the treatment for you know definitive therapy? Is there any role of surgery or source control? For example, a patient with renal abscess or a prostatic abscess, you will need surgery there. And then we come to the management of recurrent UTIs. So let us see this case. This is a case of a 55 years old male patient who is a known case of diabetes, rheumatic heart disease with severe MS and AS and he is posted for dual valve replacement. After this culture, urine culture is sent and ID reference is given. I see this culture report and I examine the patient. Now what should I prescribe? Should I prescribe imipenem, meropenem, amikacin or none of the above? Or any other, you know, I, I need just one answer before I move to my next slide. What do I prescribe? None of the above. And what is the reason? So we have to ask ourselves whether it is truly a UTI. We see the urine routine report. There are no pus cells. And this patient does not have any history of urgency, frequency, dysuria, fever, backache which suggest UTI. So contamination, colonization, because of which the urine cultures can be positive is extremely common phenomenon which happens with all of us, with many, so many patients on day to day basis. So you don't have to just jump on treating the infection. In, in fact, it is not the infection. We don't have to treat the urine culture report. We have to assess and correlate clinically. So what do we mean by asymptomatic bacteriuria? When the culture report is positive with an asymptomatic patient. Now this is very common in elderly, diabetics and immunosuppressed patients and the rates are as high as 40 to 50 percent and actually this is one area where antibiotics are used you know irrationally. So it should not be treated except in patients who are pregnant who are going to undergo any urological intervention or a patient with recent renal transplant and similarly asymptomatic candiduria you know candiduria is also so common you may have so many diabetic female patients in your OPD who come with a urine culture report positive for candida. You have to be very, very cautious in, you know, treating candida because candida UTI is an extremely rare thing and we have to always correlate clinically, do a lot of investigations to rule out colonization or, you know, contamination is less likely but most of the times colonization. So again, asymptomatic candiduria should not be treated except in neonates, neutropenic patients and patients again who are going to undergo any urological intervention. Now let's see this um, culture report. This is a 65 years old female with typical symptoms of UTI with dysuria and frequency. And this is the culture report. You can see a lot of plus, 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 plus and 4 plus and you know, amikacin, cefpodoxine, ciprofloxacin, genta, amoxicillin, levoflox, everything seems to be sensitive with different number of pluses. So can anyone tell me how do we interpret this report? Is this a good way of reporting? Are you seeing these kind of reports in the present day? So this is not the way to report and we cannot interpret anything. The reason is we don't have to compare the two antibiotics in a single report where, where you know, where which antibiotics ha has got more number of pluses. That has absolutely no meaning and does not imply that it is more sensitive as compared to the antibiotic with less number of pluses. So we have to compare the sensitivity of the antibiotic with the breakpoints which have been issued by the standard institutes like you know CLSI or UCAST. So if there are standard MIC and zone diameter breakpoints and your lab has to report by comparing the breakpoints to the present, you know, to the isolate sensitivity to the antibiotic and the report should be either S that is sensitive, I that is intermediate or R that is resistant. So if you see this kind of report, just call your lab that this is not the way to report and I cannot interpret anything from this. Now the next case is a case of a 37 years old healthy sexually active female 
who came, who started having complaint of lower abdominal pain with burning micturition for two to three days. Now she sent a urine culture on her own and started levofloxacin on her own for seven days as she was traveling. She could not contact any doctor at that time. As you can see here, there are 92 pus cells in the urine RM and she has an E. coli with a significant colony count in the urine culture. So she took levofloxacin since uh, still 7th of December. Yes, this is a recent case. And then on 12th, she consulted me in the OPD with recurrence of symptoms just after three days of stopping levoflox. So what happened wrong here? You know, did, did she do any mistake in taking the, the doses? But fine. So if we see this culture report, there are lots of antibiotics which are sensitive. Amoxiclav, ampicillin, sulbactam, ciprofloxacin, oflox, levoflox, otrimoxazole, even nitrofurantoin is sensitive. So this is not a resistant bug. So whenever we have to design a rational antibiotic therapy for UTI, what are the points we should keep in consideration? First, we have to look what is the site of infection. For example, upper urinary tract infection, there, there, there is no role of antibiotics like nitrofurantoin. Then we have to see what would be the possible likely organism and the likely susceptibility till we don't have the urine culture report. So for that you need to know your local antibiotic susceptibility patterns and the bugs which grow in your setup. Again the culture and DST reports are important and then we have to see what are the properties of the antibiotics which I am going to use. Whether it's a cytal antibiotic or static, adequate concentrations will be achieved at the site of uh, infection or not. Toxicity and side effects of course have to be kept in mind. Then there may be some patients who have previous allergies to beta-lactams, go trimoxazole. So that history is very, very important. Drugs like fluoroquinolones may have interactions with drugs which prolong the QT interval. So beware of that. Then ability to achieve source control as I already mentioned. Antibiotics like beta-lactams, TMP, SMX and fluoroquinolones. They are broad spectrum ones. And they keep, you know, do a lot of collateral damage by which we mean they select resistant organisms in the body when they are used. So try to use those antibiotics which, go, which do less collateral damage to your patient, for example, nitrofurantoin. And then of course, cost, which may not vary, uh, you know, matter much in our OPD patients at least. Now this is our recent data from ICMR and as you can see here, E. coli followed by Klebsiella followed by Proteus, Cytobacter are the most common GNBs which cause UTIs in the community. Then we can have enterococcal infections, especially in the elderly males. So there are some bugs, you know, which when grow in culture in females like enterococcus, corns and, you know, uh, uh, lectobacilli which grow in the cultures, they could be contaminants. So you have to correlate clinically and rule out contamination before jumping to treat them. However, enterococcus is known to cause infection in elderly males. Yes, that is a very common bug. Now, if we talk about starting empirical antibiotic therapy in our OPD patients, then in the order of preference, I would go for nitrofurantoin, followed by cotrimoxazole, followed by amoxiclav, then cefixine clavinate. Phosphomycin I would not use because we want to preserve this drug for our resistant organisms. Please try to avoid fluoroquinolones as empirical therapy. Two reasons. One, lot of collateral damage, lot of resistance selection. And second, most of our culture reports, if you see, you will see fluoroquinolones as resistant. So very difficult to use these antibiotics empirically. Again, tetracyclines and doxycyclines, though may, they may be sensitive, but because of the sparse data, they may have uncertain efficacy in UTI. So continuing our case, this patient, when I took the history, she had history of recurrent episodes of UTI in the last one year, and she had taken multiple antibiotics for the same. So this now is a case of recurrent simple cystitis, no other risk factors. Actually, I did a CTKUB also, but there were no risk factors which predisposed to recurrent UTI. So I treated her with cotrimoxazole, uh, you know, TMP, SMX, double strength for seven days. Now, if we talk about pathogenesis of UTIs in females, we know that females are more predisposed. And this is because, you know, of the shorter distance from anus to urethra and which leads to the fecal flora ascending into the urethra very, very frequently going to do UTIs. Now, how do we define recurrent simple cystitis? Two or more episodes in six months or three or more episodes in a year. And reinfection with the same or different organisms is more common as a cause to cause recurrent infection as compared to the relapse. Now, the risk factors could be just, you know, sexual intercourse or use of spermicide-coated condoms or diaphragms. 
those females who have mothers with history of UTIs are more predisposed. And first episode of UTI at an age of more, uh, less than 15 years of age, those females who have urinary incontinence or post void residual, of course, they are more at risk. Now, this is one area where, you know, we don't have much control. There is biological or genetic predisposition of UTIs in some females. So, there they have increased susceptibility of to vaginal colonization because of the fecal flora and higher propensity for uropathogens to adhere to the uropathogen, uh, you know, the uroepithelial cells. Now, how do we treat recurrent simple cystitis? Behavioral changes like increased fluid intake, early postcoital voiding, and you know, vaginal estrogens for postmenopausal females, cranberry products, probiotics, no major data. The only thing which works as per the studies and randomized trials is antibiotic prophylaxis. Now the catch here is you give antibiotic prophylaxis for six months, for one year, for two years. Yes, there is data for nitrofenantoin as long as you know um, two years. As you know, uh, but the problem is as soon as you stop the nitrofenantoin or any other antibiotic which you are giving prof for prophylaxis, the patient comes with the symptoms of UTI again. So yes, this is an area where it is very very difficult to treat. Now this last case, this is a case of 78 years old male patient with dysuria and increased frequency and it is showing enterococcus fecalis. So as you can see here, the sensitive antibiotics are levoflox, linezolate, doxycycline, amoxicillin. What would you choose? What is the drug of choice for enterococcal UTI? So penicillin is the drug of choice. Of course, we don't have penicillin available and amoxiclav and amoxicillin are good enough. So the drug of choice for enterococcal UTI is amoxicillin. Please remember this. Of course, if it is sensitive in the culture. Always rule out prostatitis in elderly males as the choice of antibiotics may vary and duration of treatment will be very, very prolonged if your elderly male has got a prostatitis. And this is a case of 38 years old male who was pre-morbidly healthy and he underwent, uh, he underwent cystoscopic removal of the stone and after a few days he developed an abscess in the prostate and presented with symptoms suggestive of prostatitis. So this patient has an atypical mycobacterial infection which was related to the cyst, you know, the scope contamination that is the rapid growing mycobacteria. So the take home messages from today's presentation are that before you you know, go on to empirically treat. Please know what are the possible organisms. What is your susceptibility pattern? Try to send cultures as, as at least in those patients who are having recurrent UTI so that you have, you know, culture reports to guide you. Thank you. Uh, those are my conflict of interest disclosures up there. Uh, I thought I'd start with diabetes is a very ancient disease. And you might say, how ancient? We have to go back to the time of the Egyptian pharaohs. So this is a stamp issued by Egypt in 1971 for World Health Organization Day. It depicts the physician Hesira, 3000 BC. And he wrote something which is still available today. It is known as the Ebers Papyrus. Ebers was a German Egyptologist and he bought it in 1800 in Egypt. And it is still there today in the University of Leipzig in Germany and this is what he wrote how to treat a condition like diabetes with polyuria and all over there. But this papyrus is still very interesting. It has been translated from the German which Ebers did and in chapter 20, this is 5000 years ago, he talked about the heart and the circulatory system and he said to the student the most interesting section of the papyrus is undoubtedly the ch chapter dealing with the heart or the vascular system and see what he said 5000 years ago when dryness befalls the heart behold it is the dryness of fire that befalls it he sighs often his heart is eaten up with anger this is because his heart is full of blood which in turn is due to drinking warm water and eating bad food now this most people think he described heart failure in those days and as we know heart failure is very common this is an editorial wrote 20 years ago by my good friend uh, David Bell. He said heart failure is frequent, forgotten and often fatal. And this is from the Medicare database in the US. Heart failure is highly prevalent. It occurs in one in five patients with diabetes above the age of 65 
and once you get admitted to hospital with heart failure, the prognosis is extremely poor. Median survival is less than that of some cancers. It also occurs very early. How early, you might say? Now, we do not do ultrasounds in all our patients with diabetes. This was a study done in Italy. It was called the short wave study. They took 386 people with type 2 diabetes, less than 5 years of diagnosis, A1C 7, LDL 105, blood pressure 139, 79. And they did stress testing, no inducible ischemia, and they found that two-thirds of these patients without any inducible ischemia, they already have LV dysfunction, systolic and diastolic. So it's extremely common. So let me put this case to you. This is a 56 year old male software engineer. As you know, they've got a sedentary, stressful job, routine health checkup, BMI is 28, blood pressure is 140 over 90, fasting, grand, fasting glucose was 136, A1C was 6.7, the lipids are average, LDL 138, HDL 29, uh, 39, Trix 175, really nothing. He just came in for routine health check. Nothing in the urine, no signs of retinopathy. So the question is, in addition to dietary changes and lifestyle, which of the following is the most appropriate step? Add metformin, start a DPP-4 inhibitor, start a GLP-1 receptor agonist, it's available in India now. As an old, start an SGLT2 inhibitor. Don't give him anything, he's already at goal. Goal is less than 7, his A1C is 6.7. Why should we treat him? But what are the guidelines? This is the latest guidelines. So, this was just published in January, and I'm very proud because one of my former fellows, Vanita Roda, she is on the panel over there. So, I'm extremely proud of that. So, this is what they said. Glucose lowering in type 2 diabetes, usual is healthy lifestyle behavior and all that. But then look at it. On the left side, they said the goal is not glucose control. The goal is cardiorenal risk reduction in high risk patients with who have got CVD. If you have ASCVD, they defined it over there. If you have ASCVD risk, you're above 55, you have additional risk factors like hypertension. Then they said you need to use a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2. Independent of what, anything else, independent of goal, independent of A1C, they don't even care about it. If you have heart failure and you diagnose it, then an SGLT2. And we saw the talk on CKD before. They said if you have CKD as defined over there, they said preferably an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP1 over there. After you do this cardiorenal risk management, now look at glucose management and weight goal. So first comes cardiorenal and they said of course you know you can use metformin or a combination of metformin after you've dealt with the other side and then they give you other drugs which are more effective then of course come to weight management goals and they said medications for weight loss and you could also consider metabolic surgery over there. But there's one small thing which we don't do. Avoid therapeutic inertia, reassess and modify treatment every three to six months. So let's come to, back to our patients. He's 56, he's, he's hypertensive, he's got diabetes and he's got dyslipidemia and he fits the criteria. So his A1C is six, he's got no symptoms. The guidelines today say start him either on an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So I think my question didn't come. I don't know what the audience <laughs> chose for some reason. Anyway, now I would have been interested to see because I would not have predicted that anybody would say an SGLT2 inhibitor to front. We all use metformin. Metformin has fallen down in the guidelines. And DPP-4 inhibitors which are very commonly used, they've gone down even lower in the uh, guidelines over there. In fact, I was part of the GRADE study in which we took people with five years of diabetes on metformin, which is the next best drug after metformin in people who don't have cardiovascular risk. Nobody knows the answer. Do you start SGLT2? Do you start GLP-1? Do you start a DPP-4 inhibitor? Do you start a sulfonylurea? Do you start insulin? And what did we find? We did it in a randomized, it was not double blind fashion over there. 
the best drug you can die out after metformin is the GLP-1. We did not have SGLT-2 because when we started the study, there was no SGLT-2 in 2013. The next drug after a GLP-1 is basal insulin. We put people on insulin after metformin. We took that. These are people with A1C of 7.8. The third drug was glimepiride. The least effective drug was the DPP-4 inhibitor, which I was also very surprised and shocked to see. It is used a lot over there. Anyway, these guidelines are also there in the RSSDI and uh, uh, Dr. Chandra and your good friend Banshi Sabu is part of the guidelines. They also say, if a person has established ASCB disc, heart failure, diabetic kidney disease, you need to consider an SGLT2 inhibitor. Unfortunately, they did not say high risk for, maybe in the next, this is 2020, it should come in. I think we are missing a golden opportunity not to use uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. But the question is, why are all the guidelines recommending SGLT2 inhibitors? That's because of all the studies that you know, the Amberex study, and after that, multiple studies have de demonstrated that SGLT2 inhibitors on heart failure as a primary outcome, all the studies you know about, across the whole spectrum, HEFREF, HEFEMREF, HEFPEF, outpatients, hospitalized patients, patients with, patients without diabetes, it is recommended over there. And the other thing is, the benefits occur very early, within days. In Emperor, the benefit for the heart failure hospitalization occurred at 17 days when they did a post-op. It became significant. And for CV death, it occurred at 59 days. Which drug can do that within not statins, not diuretics, not any other drug? And I just wanted to put in a plug for myself. In 2016, I wrote this article saying, this benefit is because of fuel energetics that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors actually they shift myocardial and kidney fuel metabolism away from glucose and fat, which are energy inefficient in the setting of diabetes, towards a super fuel like ketone bodies. And many people didn't like that I use the word ketone bodies over there. But guess what? This is 2020. Now, in heart failure, they are looking at therapeutic ketosis, using ketones to treat heart failure because the heart li likes it over there. In fact, in this article, they said several studies have demonstrated the potential for ketone and they said all the early in its stage of development, therapeutic ketosis holds significant promise. So let me get, get, ask another question. Which of the following drugs, I'm not a cardiologist, so we have great cardiologists sitting over here. Which of the following drugs are recommended to treat heart failure regardless of uh, ejection fraction, AHA, SCA, ARMIs? Beta blockers, MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitors, or take a combination. I forgot to put diuretic. Regardless of ejection fraction. Uh, okay, SGLT2 inhibitors are me and some people. But that, that's great. Those are great answers. So we all know about the four pillars. So this was just published, uh, you know, over there. And is it time to treat heart failure regardless? And what they said is the ejection fraction is less than 40, 40 to 49 and above 50. They said armies. it is a class 1 recommendation as we all know for HEFREF. But MREF and HEFPEF, it is a 2B recommendation. MRAs are also come in as a 2B recommendation across the spectrum. But SGLT2 is the only one which has got a 2A classification. So SGLT2 inhibitors, we heard before, you can combine it with other things, but you have to be careful of you know, the potassium, the thing. So let me finish. We have come a long way in 5,000 years. This was Hesi Ra who described, in my opinion, something like heart failure. He described, look at his treatment for diabetes. He said, take a measuring glass filled with water from the bird pond, add elderberry, fresh milk, beer swill, flowers of the cucumber, mix it up, combination treatment, take it for four days. That's what he prescribed for a disease very much like diabetes. And through the centuries, people have used susruta, charaka, herbs, chemicals, extreme diets to treat diabetes. And of course, insulin came around in 1922. And 90 years ago, we got SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, which literally turns 
when the drug was there, it said SGLT2 inhibitors turning symptoms into therapy. This was a JAM editorial. These people wrote a novel cardioprotective therapy that also improves glycemia. So it is not a glucose lowering drug. It has made a transformation into a drug that improves it. And of course, Eugene Brownwald said, they are the statins of the 21st century. And he really did it. So I think this is really, we have come. If I can put one thought in your mind is, if you diagnose a person with diabetes and if there are no obvious contraindications, think of an SGLT2 inhibitor. Metformin is there, but it has gone lower down. And actually, we have studied, met, people say metformin prevents cancer, prevents heart attack, nothing. When we did the diabetes prevention program, we have uh, uh, data for 27 years, nothing for heart failure, nothing for uh, cancer, nothing, not, not even for CVD. We don't have any data. Thank you so much for your time. So, talking about GRD, we don't have any uh, particular definition about GRD. But uh, what API ISG guidelines says is, reflux of gastric contents into esophagus resulting in significant symptoms, that is heartburn or regurgitation, for at least once a week, for at least once a month. Or it is complicated by peptic structure, Barrett's esophagus or GI bleeding. So according to the definition, most of us may fall into GRD. Now the prevalence all around the world is around 15 to 30 percent. Pathogenesis is hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter, the pressure less than 10 mm of Hg, frequent transient relaxations of the lower esophageal sphincter, which are physiological, but in some patients it may be more. Now anatomical alterations like hiatus hernia or obesity, environmental factors like lifestyle, addiction and medication. Addictions means tobacco or alcohol, tobacco has been proved with GRD, alcohol has not been proved to be associated with GRD. Now it has been classified into esophageal and extra esophageal syndromes. Esophageal syndromes we all know, reflux esophagitis, stricture, barrett esophagus or esophageal adenocarcinoma. In extra esophageal sy syndromes, patients may present with chronic cough, laryngitis, asthma and dental erosion. The proposed associations are pharyngitis, sinusitis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or recurrent otitis media which has not been proved. Now, GRD is a clinical diagnosis but in some of the patients you may require tests. So which are the tests we will do? First is the upper GI endoscopy, second is ambulatory pH metry with impedance and third is manometry. Now what you will find in when will you do upper GI endoscopy on all patients with alarm symptoms like dysphagia, odinophagia, GI bleeding, iron deficiency anemia and in patients all with progressive weight loss. In other patients like refractory GRD, the patients who are not responding to PPI even after two weeks of therapy, they require upper GI endoscopy. Now, what do you find in upper GI endoscopy? You can grade the esophagitis from grade A to D depending upon the severity of erosions and ulcers. You may find anatomical alterations like hiatus hernia. You can see complications of chronic GRD like Barrett's esophagus and in some patients with stricture. Now, some patients where you have not find any cause of GRD, you may biopsy the patient during endoscopy to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, ambulatory pH metry with impedance procedure involves an insertion of pH catheter 5 cm above the LES and pH is continuously monitored for 24 hours. And we see the acid exposure time during the procedure, symptoms correlation with acid exposure, Normal acid exposure time in all of us normal patients is around 4 to 6 percent. We also note the number of reflux episodes during the pH metric. The normal reflux episodes are 40 to 80. Above 80 is considered as abnormal. Now pH metric with impedance, what does it mean? Impedance means that we calculate, we see non-acid reflux events along with the acid reflux events. Now, when will you do pH metric? In all patients of refractory GRD with patients with atypical symptoms, prior to anterior reflux surgery in all patients, patients with normal upper GI endoscopy, typical symptoms of GRD but not responding to proton pump inhibitor. In all patients with refractory GRD, we do pH metry, and in those patients in whom GRD has been excluded, other causes for symptoms including non-acid reflux, eosinophilic esophagitis, esophageal dysmotility disorders, 
functional heart pain functional chest pain should also be excluded the management of grd encompasses lifestyle modification pharmacotherapy and surgery pharmacotherapy we have locally acting antacids which are the concept of action but the relief is uh, less about 1 to 3 hours only and you have newer compounds with sodium alginate which forms raft and prevents acid reflux sucral fat histamine receptor blockers proton pump inhibitor remains the mainstay in the treatment of grd uh, coming to pharmacokinetics of gr ppis of the all available ppi they have the similar bioavailability but the half life of dexo dexlenzoprazol is the longest so the dexlenzoprazol is the longest acting ppi primary excision is to the liver in all ppis and according to the liver metabolism all ppi are metabolized by cyp2c19 enzyme but dexlenzoprazol and pentoprazol have other enzymes like cyp3a4 and pentoprazol also has a second enzyme now once the patient has come to you with typical symptoms of grd the initial treatment would be the four weeks of ppi in standard dose standard dose means a od dose partial if patient is not responding or has a partial response then you can increase the dose to twice daily and if patient is not responding to 8 weeks of ppi in optimal dose it is defined as refractive grd presence of erosive esophagitis even after 8 weeks of ppi may be treated with further 4 to 8 weeks of ppi and in such patients we require long term maintenance therapy the dose of ppi should be optimized or adding a histamine receptor blocker at night should be considered in all patients who are having nocturnal reflux despite use of ppi now regarding the role of prokinetics in grd they have no proven role in routine management but patients with grd and functional dyspepsia overlap or who are volume reflux and evidence of gist, delayed gastric emptying they may benefit from addition of prokinetics particularly what we see in diabetic patients now ppi side effects side effects this is an important slide most of our patients with erosive uh, grd re require long term of ppi therapy in those patient what should be think of the side effects the literature has mentioned many side effects but causal relationship has been found only with enteric infection structural and functional changes in gastric mucosa that causes atrophic gastritis and other is acute kidney injury but chronic kidney disease dementia gastrointestinal malignancies cardiovascular effects events related to metabolism of clopidogrel pneumonia osteoporosis bone fractures they have not found their insufficient evidence of casualty most of the studies were observational and retrospective studies so as of now we cannot establish the side effect profile of ppi with this uh, diseases <laughs> now we should know the phenotypes of grd based on our 24 hour ph metry and manometry so they can be treated in a scientific way we have according to classified into esophageal reflux disease non esophageal reflux disease reflux hypersensitivity and functional heart pain erd and nerd may be diagnosed based on upper gi endoscopy whether erosions are present or not but similar symptoms other 24 hours ph metry and everything is same in both these cases they both respond well to ppi but coming to reflux hypersensitivity on ph metry they have non acid reflux more than acid reflux and symptoms correlation is sometimes not there in functional heart pain the ph metry is absolutely normal upper gi endoscopy is also normal in when we do manometry in these patients we mostly find esophageal dysmotility disorders so how we treat phenotypes of grd when there is erosive grd ppi is the answer but such patients may require long term therapy with ppi these patients should be given smallest dose to control the symptoms non esophageal reflux disease most of them respond to ppi and when they require long term therapy it can also be given in patients with reflux hypersensitivity ppi along with baclofen which inhibits the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation may be tried and it has been found to be successful in functional heart pain along with ppi you can add tricyclic antidepressants now coming to the role of endoscopic reflux anti reflux therapy in chronic grd we have radio frequency application like stata procedures 
endoscopic plication modalities in India, GERDEX is available. Mucosal resection techniques, we have anti-reflux mucosectomy. This anti-reflux procedures should only be done when the hiatus hernia is less than 2 cm and there is a low segment parity esophagus. Now coming to the response to this treatment, it ranges from 16 to 80% but the duration of response is less than 50% in long term. Surgery and GRD, when will you do surgery? Nissan's fundoplication, that is a total fundoplication or partial fundoplication. Uh, when will you do? The indication remains failed medical management, large hiatus hernia or, or patient has peptic stricture or Barrett's esophagus. Occasionally we can do uh, these extra esophageal manifestations. Around 4.4% of the patient when doing left Nissan fundoplication, 4.4% will have acute complications. But recurrence rate at uh, one year it is around 18%. So, modern medical anti-reflux therapy and laparoscopic fundoplication seems to have similar efficacy in healing the symptoms and endoscopic signs of GERD. Conclusion is, it is important to understand the various phenotypes of GERD. EPI work based in syndromes with proven acid reflux and in erosive diseases. Efficacy of PPI in extraesophageal syndromes is not too good. Rebiprazole and pentoprazole have very less drug interaction potentially be considered in patients with comorbidities and multiple medications. Established benefits of PPI far outweigh their theoretical risk when used to treat GRD. Surgery is choice of surgery is choice in patients refractory to medical therapy, suffer primarily from regurgitation, do not want to take medicine, or have a large hiatus therapy. Thank you.